This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and a very welcome to our sunset drive. Today, all the way from Sevisons in the Greater Kruger National Park. My name is David and on the camera today is Fag. Very excited. That boy has been on leave for a couple of days. I've never met him and I'm meeting him for the first time today. Just been resting there on that Tamad Mound and the local name for Tamad Mound is Shidulu and the leopard Shidulu was not very far from this area from yesterday and this morning. Just chancing if you could see her this morning, I mean uh, this afternoon. Temperatures very good, 24 degrees Celsius and 76 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not alone today. I got some other gentleman called Ruff who is doing walking and I got a girl called Taylor who is doing exactly what I am doing. We're all looking for leopard. Remember this drive is very interactive. Keep in touch with us, follow us on the YouTube chat stream but most important keep tweeting on Safari, Safari Lab on hashtag and we'll be able to answer all your questions. Alrighty. Okay, all your tweets hashtag safari live and you'll keep us going and answering all your questions to start with taylor might have got some interesting animal on the third second minute of the drive we do we do we do i can't believe that this is how we've started off our safari with an elephant. Now, there's definitely one missing, and I'll show you why in a minute. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is David. It's good to be here. David and I were talking about how much we love work. It's our favorite thing because we get to come out and do things like this. How cool is that? Elephant right off the bat. Now, just a moment here, I made a statement. I said that the I think there's some more elephants around here. Might be hard to see now, but she's got a wet mammary gland. So a youngster must have been trying to have a drink at some point. Now, where are you, little one? This could be, well, she could be part of a bigger herd. I suppose we're in the drainage system now. And it's a nice area to feed. They might be deciding they're going to come and dig for some fresh water. Some ox peckers also going overhead. Wonder where they're off to. Perhaps Bifflesook Dam. Or maybe these elephants are on their way towards Buffalo so, Dam. David, I wonder if there are going to be any surprises down that end of the world. We'll have to find out. Anyways, this is very, very nice though. I can't believe that calf is not at her side. Unless it was somebody else's calf. No, man. It must be her calf. That's ridiculous. It has to be her calf. I can't hear anything either. I thought if I paused for a second, I'd maybe, maybe hear some of the other elephants. That's not the case. Bizarre. The mystery of the elephants, but hopefully we'll be able to solve this puzzle at some point. This is actually a really good area. We were talking about it not so long ago, about how as we head into the drier season and things start to disappear like water, there's a really nice spot down just in the drainage up ahead where the gremlins normally get us. Literally just off to the side here, down and along, maybe about 200 meters or so. It's beautiful. They always dig there, they roll around in the mud and things like that. Are you getting comms? Communication. Kirsten, are you still alive? Do I even still have a signal? We're in a really dodgy spot, so I thought, I promise you, because it's happened to me so many times, where well, you just carry on. And you just go on and on and on and on and on and you just think, okay, cool, you know, must be busy. <laughs> then, and then you've actually been off air for 10 minutes. It's hilarious. Anyways, I think, is there another elephant that you can hear, David, or is it that same girl stretching through? Just her. Nah, I don't know where the rest of her herd is. It's unusual. But anyways, well... Hello to all of you, because I believe you're just uh, well saying hello, so we'll say hello again. Remember, you can actually ask us questions, because this is a live and interactive safari. Hashtag safari live on Twitter, or you can talk to us via the YouTube chat. Remember, it is show a tree some love day. Is it? Was that what it was called? Or love a tree day? Love a tree day. That's actually what it was called. I think I actually heard some munching from behind us. 
maybe. Maybe the elephants are already ahead of this count. So we'll do a bit of investigating. Otherwise, um, in the meantime, I'm going to send you to Ralph to see if he can find some of the smaller things on the ground. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome aboard on the Sunset Bushwalk. I say welcome aboard, but we're out on foot, and we're in the Juma Concession of the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. And my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera we've got Craig. How's it, Craig? And we've also got our um, game scout with us here, Ephraim, who gave us that wonderful story yesterday about the, um, the leopards and where Safari had started all uh, the line of the leopards with the little den site that we found. Now, it seems like there has been uh, lots of action with the leopards. Hopefully, the guides will be able to catch up with them. So, we're not going to be concentrating on the spotted cats this afternoon. We're looking for the small little guys like these little dwarf mongoose now a moment ago there was also some hornbills with them which is a little bit of a symbiotic relationship between these two uh, creatures the birds and the little mammals called the dwarf mongoose and the dwarf mongoose assist them in uh, that they scurry around looking for all sorts of invertebrates, little insects, and the hornbills also feed on the same kind of things. So the mongoose assist in bumping them up for the hornbills, and the hornbills then assist the mongoose in a, w a very good warning signal, um, especially from birds uh, in the sky, as well as little uh, kind of predators on the ground as well like for instance your caracal or your jackals but it's always wonderful to see uh, these little guys especially out on foot we do need to give them just a little bit of time to come out of their burrows now it seems like Taylor's got a very sleepy massive mammal to show you so let's head off to her We do, and I feel terrible. I'm sorry, little elephant. I didn't mean to wake you. So we came around the corner just after mom decided to just actually have a look, little look ahead. And the next minute, this little thing popped out from the long grass, and we didn't even know that it was there. I think, I think it eventually will sit down and go back to sleep again. It was lying down. So this must be the young calf that uh, Will was by mom's side. I'm sorry. Do you want David to sing you a lullaby? Come, David, I know you want to sing a lullaby. <laughs> Thank you, David. I don't know if you heard the little twinkle, twinkle, little star. We almost got there that David was trying to sing this little elephant. Actually, James should actually be, James should actually be here right now. James could sing him a lullaby. Oh, so precious. But look, those eyes are getting heavy again and with a belly filled with milk, I'm sure that you're not going to be able to keep your eyes open for too much longer. So it's best to sit down now. Nice little spot there too. Shame when it stood up, it did a little tummy rumble as if to say, Mom, where are you? Um, stranger danger. <laughs> I wonder if it shouted that. <laughs> I don't think so there. And then Mom rumbled back. Just to let the little one know that she's around and if those things give you any trouble you just need to call and she'll be here in two seconds or as my dad says two shakes of a lamb's leg come little one go back to sleep now i'd really like it to see if this elephant would go back to sleep because that means that it's super relaxed with us <laughs> kestrel fox you're swinging rock by baby in the treetop <laughs> the bush edition I'm going to sleep now okay I think it's resting up on that log there's actually a little log in there I think I can't really see much though so most of the time when an elephant actually ends up having a siesta they'll just stand like this motionless probably switching you know resting their back legs switching it up a little bit but the youngsters, oh, they're not afraid of laying down. There we go. Go on down, little one. Bend your knees. <laughs> oh, 
father. If I were to sing anything to this elephant, it would be a disaster. It would probably start trumpeting in fear. So I won't be. But how cool would that be? A couple of times, though, in the Mara, I had to come around the corner and think, well, I thought it was a big grey termite mountain and then it ended up not being a termite mountain, it ended up being an elephant sleeping next to the road with its little calf also sleeping with it flat, flat, flat. It was so funny. Sometimes you can hear them snore too. Come on, little one, just go to sleep. Although there are a couple of elephants running around, so if this little guy does hear them having fun. and might go, I'm not having a nap today. I'm going to go and play with the other kids. <laughs> mm, it's eating now. I heard it pull a piece of grass or something. Oh, maybe there's some roots there too. <laughs> and Joe, I think one of my favorite things about little elephants is very similar to yours, is when they try and use their trunks and haven't trained all the muscles yet so that's definitely a firm favorite and then another one is the bravery that a young elephant calf has when mom's around so when they decide to mock charge your car open ears you know being all tough and scary you know we wouldn't we wouldn't you know burst out laughing if it was mom that was doing that to us we'd probably be reversing so um, i like it when they do that that's always quite funny and they always seem so disappointed in the reaction that they they get which is normally like i said us all cackling oh little one what's going on amazing right i think this little one maybe it will sit down we'll stay with it for a bit longer ralph however has a secret bird hidden away look at how pretty this little bird is that we're watching here and often they are quite nervous when you come close to them this is a predatory bird a raptor uh, but one of the smallest of its kind it's a little pearl spotted owlet and it's got a very distinct call and when it does call it can often get mobbed by the little birds as well because they all gang together and try to get rid of it but uh, I'm going to attempt to try and call it's not the time of the year that they generally call back but let's just see if it has any reaction I'm not the best at it so let's just see and my mouth is also a bit dry so I'll try my best obviously just because it heard me it might be looking over its shoulder the beautiful little birds they are and I'm, as I say I'm not the best at it the high pitch at the end is the most important part and as I say this time of the year they don't generally respond but I just wanted to see if he turned his head and faced us they are normally sort of crepuscular as well so more active at dawn and dusk and into the night time hours but dawn and dusk is when they do most of their hunting because then there's still some active little birds but even at this time of day there's like the leopards there's a potential of them being on the hunt on the prowl but very nice to see that this one is set nice and close Uh, 13 rainbows there's a couple of owls that do have uh, the false eyes on the back but I think the one that is the most prominent is the um, spotted eagle owl they do have those ones on the back of the head but there's all different owls all over the world and um, it's one of the small little owlets as well that uh, does have the eyes on the back it's not the pearl spotted eyelet it's the eh, I forget the name now uh, which one the, it, is it the pearl spotted no but he also does have little eyes there the barred owlet as well the scops owl he doesn't have the eyes on the back of his head he looks more, more like the bark of uh, a lot of these trees so his camouflage is more the bark 
and it is absolutely fascinating. So there are a few of them with those reasonable eyes on the back of their heads. Anyway, let's, uh, that was a wonderful little encounter. We're going to continue. Let's head you on back to Taylor with the Sleeping Giants. The little one finally went to sleep. How cool is that? Finally. At probably about 40 seconds after he left us. Murphy's Law. It just went one, two, three, plop onto its side. Well, and there it continues to sleep. So that's pretty cool. So that just goes to show you how mom was probably about 50 meters away. The little one is still comfortable to go back to sleep. Ryan, most certainly, these elephants are vulnerable when they sleep like that. But now, this little elephant is sleeping with all the other elephants around, and they're on the go, so mom's not too far away. There's a young bull that's also now rudely decided to come and feed next to this young elephant as it, uh, as it tries to sleep. It's not making quite a bit of noise, too. So I don't think anything could happen to this little elephant with the entire herd uh, pretty much surrounding it. And as we sit here longer more and more elephants start to pop up. So I think it'll be fine. I mean, if a lion were to come in here, I can tell you right now, someone will pick on it, up on it. And even if they were to try and attack that elephant, it would take them a long, long time before they'd do any serious damage. And before that could even happen, again, the herd, the rest of the herd will be in here super quickly and, uh, and sort the problem out and chase those lions away. But we'll... Shall we roll down there, David? Let's see what this young bull has got to say. We're not going to start the car. The one to wake the baby. We're going to roll in. Oh, no, no. Hello, boy. It's okay. Don't be scared. It's still just us. We're a little bit nervous. I'm going to just keep rolling. If he doesn't like us, then I'll roll past him. But I think it's okay. No, you don't need to be scared of us. Not even a little bit. We just came to say hello. Hey, youngster. Let's see if he settles down. Perhaps the little one again. Or David. Not sure. <laughs> don't know how much of the ambient you're hearing. But there are lots of, lots of gurgling noises going on back here. <laughs> Everyone's laughing in FC and saying it's David. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay, well, that's pretty cool, little one. I mean, he's just a bit shy. Let's see. Are you not going to come down and feed again? Are you just going to move away completely? I think. Mean, oh, it's a female. Although I thought I saw, well. Well, Alvarek who is a new viewer, this is what I thought. I thought when I saw this elephant, I actually thought it had, I could see its bits that make him a man. It is a boy. What am I talking about? It had a very square head, hey, don't you think? For a male, so typically, there we go. That's one of the things. A male has got a very rounded head. That one has got more of a square head. So that wasn't a good example to look at, but typically they're very, very round. And then the other way is, of course, you just look in between the back legs to see if it's a boy or not. So it's very easy to tell that way and then the females have got mammary glands obviously between their legs so do the males except the females swell when they start to produce milk so when you see that that's a good way those are the, for me those are the two most obvious ways but it does become quite difficult if they're standing in the thick bushes so you can also make mistakes but that's not a problem you can just learn from your mistakes I often say the other thing Kirsty Kirst just try to say something no that must be the other voices in my head. Sorry, I thought something else had happened for a second. <laughs> no, I literally heard, I thought somebody said, when you, something, and then I was like, no, nah, I think I made that up. I did make it up. Didn't hear that at all. Perhaps I'm starting to hear what the animals are saying. No, I'm joking. <laughs> That's not the case. So I don't think a particularly big herd, just because I haven't heard much vegetation moving around. I'm seeing about another five elephants in here. And not too many big cows. A lot of them are youngsters. The others could be a little bit further towards Vulture's Nest or up on Central. Maybe they've already been to Bovelzook Dam, but I can't say that I saw wet feet or a wet trunk at any point. Just hiding behind the trees. 
Hopefully it will burst through there and make a real entrance, hey, David? Mm. That would be quite nice. No, just going to stop and feed. Just for a little bit. And they're all feeding on different things. Some are feeding on teak. Some are feeding on bush willows and grasses. I think I'd be trying to make the most of the grass now. Oh, it did too, David. Can you believe it? It did. It burst right through. Head shaking and all. Let's see what happens here. Are you a bit braver than the elephant we just had an encounter with? Yes, you're coming straight towards us. With your meal, please do not throw that stick at me. I like that. Just walk down, sort of show a bit of confidence, and then just quickly exit through the wattles. Do you like bursting through trees, young elephant? I'm sure that must feel quite nice, like I'm scratching their backs with all those branches. Might be quite cool. Right, now I know David is always on a leopard search and I don't blame him, because why wouldn't you want to see all the leopards that you can and the sabi sad, so let's see where he's headed to now. Right, we just come to the area where Shidulu was seen this morning by James and we did not see any sign of her. I've gathered that Shidulu is one very swift girl. She'll be here one minute, the next one minute she'll be two kilometers away. So we thought, all right, Shidulu, let me go try my old friend Tingana and find out if he could be on his kill that he has had for the last two or three days. We just found some nice antelope nyala. Where did it go, Fag? But he's just trying to sneak there and his Anyala antelope there. It's uh, always very shy. You stop, they're fine, but the moment you switch off the engine, they're like, mm, sorry, I have to go. And you can see, uh, there's a young one there, a female just next to it. Very good fun. But yes, not very cooperative. So what we do, why fact, don't we go to Tingana and chance if we could be lucky to see him. And Ruff got a feathered friend at the moment. Now everybody, this is very, very cool because that to me looks like a Jacobin's cuckoo, but I think it is an immature and I see some brown birds hopping around in the bottom. I don't know if they're dusky fly catchers or something of the sorts, but I'm pretty sure that this Jacobin's cuckoo is uh, or is being raised by these little brown birds that are hopping, uh, going up. And it's, you see how that Jacobin's is now flitting its wings? That means that it's trying to stimulate the adults to come and feed it. And when I first saw it, I thought, that's strange, because we've seen a couple of Jacobin's cuckoos around recently, and normally they wouldn't be around this time of year because they do migrate. But with it being raised by the adults, obviously it's still around at this time now. So it's, it's just busy being fed, but the adults are probably half its size. So I don't know if we're going to get to see them, but that is amazing that we're actually seeing uh, the whole uh, brood parasite in motion where the adults have already left. They pop their eggs in another uh, bird's or species nest, and now this one being fed, I think it's dusky flycatchers or something like that. I just saw the brown adults flitting around. And there's small little calls from the cuckoo as well, just a weep, weep, as it's doing a little bit of preening as well. And I must add that I'm pretty sure that I misidentified that uh, little owl earlier as a pearl spotted. I think it was a barred owlet uh, because we just chatted quickly afterwards and we got a closer look. But uh, look at that. That is amazing. That's awesome. A little Jacobin's cuckoo. It's uh, nice for us to come in this drainage line. I think it's perfect. We're just below Vuyotilla Dam and we rarely get to see cuckoos just relaxing like that. Now, Ravinda, um, I also love the cuckoo's call, but for me, I always remember the Jacobin's call because he does Jacobin's, Jacobin's. So it's like a wee beep, wee beep, 
Weep, beep, beep. Weep, beep, beep. So I, I remember her just going, Jacobins, Jacobins. But you can see he's not that perfect black color either. A little bit mottled, almost a little bit of brown color, and that very typical immature flitting of the wings like that, trying to stimulate the adults to feed it. It would be wonderful to see the adults actually come up and feed it. And I would love to see who are the surrogate parents here, because they do have a few different kinds of parents that they would use. And that is wonderful. I can just, just hear him calling a little bit. Uh, crafty, that's one of the questions, a fantastic question that, when does it know that it's a cuckoo? Uh, well, we as humans still don't understand how these birds actually work that out because as soon as it's got enough strength and as soon as it's grown enough, it literally takes to the wing and uh, heads out on the migratory patterns that the adults would normally go on. Now, I've, I think I might have spotted one of the adults just through there, Craig. I don't know if you can see it. That brown bird just on the branch there, I'm not sure what it is from here. It's a brown bird. It's just hopping. I don't know if it's a babbler or a shrike. One of the two has just gone behind there. I don't know. That, that would be quite difficult. For, sounds like a babbler. I don't know if they're just here at the same time. It's just dropped down. I don't know if they're here just uh, by coincidence. There might be a few of them around. I need to check up. I'm not sure if the Jacobins cuckoo use um, the Aramark babblers as a, as a host. It would be quite unusual. I can't remember, but I'd have to check that up. But that cuckoo's still just sitting there. And yes, absolutely amazing that these cuckoos, um, it's almost just totally instinctive. They move off um, on their migratory patterns once they've got enough strength, once they've grown enough, and they can uh, then just fly off. And uh, it's one of those unexplained phenomenons, really. But lovely to sit and see, see him sitting here and allowing us to, to watch it, because you often just see the cuckoo very fleetingly and sometimes struggle to even find them, especially like the red-chested cuckoo. You always hear them calling. The pit may fro, we call them. Pit may fro, pit may fro. And they call like that, but very difficult to see them in the thickets. And this cuckoo is showing itself up the top there and still really trying to get the adults, which I'm not quite sure what species are. Now, uh, Thomas, uh, out of all of us here, I know that Brent, he really likes to climb around and check little birds out. Um, I think uh, Tristan is also a very, very good birder. I think through, from evidence, I would have to uh, put my mark next to Tristan. I must say, I'm not the biggest birder. I do, uh, over the years, when I first started as a guide, uh, I didn't really have too much interest in birds at all. But it's like when you're speaking a language, as soon as you start to speak the language a little bit, and you can understand a little bit, you get confident, and you want to speak more. Well, the more I learned about birds, and the more I got the identifications right, the more I wanted to know about them. And so it's increased with my years. And over the 20 years, I would say in the last five years, five to eight years is when I've really started to actually get it nailed down and but we still all make mistakes it's like that pearl spotted owlet misidentified uh, that was a barred owlet now we're going to continue on we're going to leave this little guy alone hopefully you get a meal from the adults but let's head you on over to David who I'm sure also does like the birds budding is one of my strengths I would say because where I come from in Kenya, we've got so many bird species. I think we got about 1,100 or so bird species, and it's like they're discovering more species every other few months. So budding is something I really like, and it gives you a very big challenge when you're dealing especially with the small birds, the small brown ones, that when you try to identify them and they give you a difficult time especially if the light is not very good or the juveniles or for example during the breeding plumage when they look different from their normal actual adult colors 
it becomes quite a challenge. So the small ones, I do not know where this name came from, but the small ones, the brown ones, when they are very difficult, we'll always say or call them little brown jobs or LBJs because you call one bird and you might end up giving it three different names and the same species, depending on the light, depending on the age, or depending on it is uh, plumage that it might be having. We got, for example, uh, let me see, we got, for example, some kites, for example, uh, that may look very different. Let me see this, like the Tony Eagle, for example, yes. Tony Eagle is one same species of bird, but it appears in two different moths. So we have the dark moth and the light moth, and it's the same bird, eh? So we're getting very close to where we left Tingana the other day. I think, uh, I think that tree there, I'll keep going. And we want a chance and find out if there could be anything happening. We can see the tree from a distance. And uh, I think it should be that tree there, Fug. We want to get close and find out. Let's see. Let's look from here. Let's see if there's anything happening there. There's an impala below it. And you never know if there's an impala there just doing nothing, then it would mean there's no harm there. And it will be very safe. And Tingana might have moved away. There were alleys this morning in that area, which would mean if he left, he never came back. Nothing we can see from here. So just try and go inside and try and explore that area more and find out if he's still there or he left and never came back because of the alleys. Those alleys are here, it was a very huge herd of them and because the tree was just entered from here. The brown ivory tree is fruiting this time around, unlike the marulas, so big numbers of alleys definitely will intimidate a leopard. Let's see if he came back or not, you never know. But this is exactly where we saw him three days ago when he brought down that female impala and came and hoisted it up here. Is it? Can you get it? Right below there, there's a what? There's a pig there, and I wouldn't know what that water could be doing. Reverse. Okay, let me just keep coming. We've got a pig right there, and again, just like the Nyala, he just took up. He's still there doing his business. Uh, let's see whether he's gonna frame my move forward a little bit and see. Okay, let's see, let's see. Can I see a fuck? And there it is. That's the peak there. I don't know what it could be doing under this tree. Waiting on a... How did I kill? I'm not sure you saw a monkey jump on top of that tree there. Fuck, but you're going to find out very shortly. I saw something move on that branch there. Let's just get close and find out what could be. We just saw some movement. There's some buds on top of it. This is an actual tree where Tingana had his kill. Do you want me back up a little bit for the kill? Foot. Okay. But this is the actual tree and the brown every tree. And find out if Mr. T could be around here. All the elephants sent him away completely. Okay, one moment. We're going to turn around. No sign of Mr. T yet, but I'm sure. The kill is still there. The good position for the kill or back up is good. 
So the kill is right here. Sorry, Fag, but I think those Ellis might have intimidated him not even to come back. And leopards will also once in a while eat beetles too. Oh, look at this, everyone. There's a little ladybird. It looks like it's preparing itself to fly. Oh, there it goes. I thought it was going to do that. Now, that's quite, a, that's quite interesting because I, I'm not an expert on ladybirds, but I do know that uh, just recently I read something on about um, ladybirds. Normally we have the red ones, and I heard that there was an exotic ladybird that has, I can't remember where it's come from. I think it might have been Europe, um, but uh, it's actually quite aggressive uh, here in our local bush, and if I'm not mistaken, they actually compete with our local little red ladybirds, those orange ones. But I'd have to tell a dam. And I just wanted to make mention because this morning we, we, um, we were up at Biffle's Hook and there was no geese there, Egyptian geese. And everybody said that on the, uh, the dam cam that they had seen the, the uh, Egyptian geese at Vuyatella Dam. Now, we might make a loop and go back there and check it out. But uh, if it is indeed those... Uh, Egyptian geese that have moved from Biffles Hook Dam down to Vuyatella, where there's no water. I wonder what's going on there if the adults just said, well, we're going to go out on an expedition. We're going camping, kids. And they dragged them all the way by foot because those little goslings can't fly. And if it is those same ones, well, those little youngsters have definitely gone on a massive expedition all the way from Biffles Hook to Vuyatella Dam. That would be like uh, the equivalent of what I've just done uh, last year, July. I was walking from uh, Port Edward on the east coast of South Africa to Port Alfred, which was just over 500 kilometers. It took me three weeks in my backpack, uh, all on my own. But uh, I tell you, that's pretty much the equivalent. And I can, uh, I can vouch for the fact that at the end of my expedition, I was... Uh, pretty knackered. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that those little goslings, uh, well, it's going to make them uh, pretty fit after that. If they've walked through bush like what we're walking through right now, uh, it's not exactly easy. If you're a little gosling walking over all of this kind of stuff, lots of uh, uh, things to climb through. Now, Daniel from Scotland, Egyptian geese are not ducks. They are one of our wild geese, so they get quite a bit bigger than the ducks, and the geese would include the Egyptian geese, the spurwing geese, which is our biggest goose that we do get here, and we've also got um, a, a few different ducks, like the yellow-billed duck and the South African shell duck and all of those, but uh, slightly different uh, to the ducks and also slightly larger, but definitely um, a goose and they're also a very common type of goose that we get, the Egyptian goose, all over Africa. Um, and I'm not sure why they called it the Egyptian goose. I'd actually have to check that up. But uh, uh, I don't know if it's because of their coloration. But very interesting how those little goslings have followed the adults and walked all the way from Biffles Hook to Vuyatella Dam. Now, I'd have to confirm I'm going to go back there and go and check. And if they return to Biffles Hook, because I'm sure they're going to have to go to at least somewhere where there's a little bit more prominent water, because at, um, at Vuyatella it's pretty much dry. And we're heading into the dry season at the moment. So they're going to have to either go back to Biffles Hook Dam or go to one of these little pans around here, maybe Treehouse Dam or, or Twin Dams, but that's going to be another expedition in itself. So whatever lies ahead for those little geese is going to be very interesting indeed. So their little journey has only just begun, and I can tell you that there's going to be predators waiting for them at every corner when they go through the bush. And if those adults have already made them get to Vuyatella Dam with no predators taking them out, well, they've done a good job already, but they've still got a long way to go. Um, oh, we're just seeing some fork-tailed drongos there having a little bit of a fight. But uh, speaking of, of animals that uh, they'd like to fight, I don't know if Tingana has had any recent fights, but um, let's head you off to David because he's with him. Right after trying to get hold of Shidulu, uh, we gave up, got a bit frustrated, 
But I thought, yes, that was not the end of the world. I had already formed a very special bond with the Duke of Juma at the moment, Mr. T. And there he is, Tingana himself. This morning, I hear there's a wild chase, and we had Ellie's come into this brown ivory tree because it's fruiting at the moment. And uh, when other trees like the marulas are not fruiting, and then uh, the brown ivory trees will do that, definitely elephants will come for them. And the Tingana boy could not stand. I think there was a huge herd of Ellie's, and they forced him down, and you know, he took off. Raf was around, waited for quite some time, you know, he never came back. And we are lucky, I think, after the Ellis left, he is back to the job he had done well to get, to keep, you know, uh, protecting his kill. Leopards, you know, the challenges they go, you know, through of trying to get prey down. So it's very difficult for them to make a kill and just leave it without at least almost finishing it, unless maybe they find or they get another kill. First time I saw Tingana, he had two kills, two impalas close to each other. That, that, that was very special. I'm equally happy. Uh, I'm equally happy that you're enjoying to see Tingana again. And I heard you had missed him for a couple of days. And it's good for him to show up. And if you are happy, I'm happier. And James this morning was talking of how Tingana is coming back into shape. He either looked a bit and well the last time, that's a crested Franklin walking, um, you know, two of them walking in front of Tingana there. I don't know whether any of one of them would want to go and give us a little scratch and tell it, hi Tingana, David is around, eh? Franklin, not interested. And, you know, James said he looks better than he was, maybe, I'm not sure, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. And Hukumuri should know Tingana truly is quite in charge here. Eh? A bit warm at 76 maybe now. I'm not sure that the temperatures have dropped, but you can see the panting, but not as heavy if it was much warmer than that. I would guess anything over 80, the panting could be more than that. But that's very typical of all cats. <laughs> Laura, you wonder what Tingana dreams of. Let's make a guess. Before I tell you what I think, Laura, send, 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 send us a tweet on hashtag Safari Live. And just give me two dreams you think Tingana you know, would be going through his mind like now when he's having a nap. I'm also thinking mine, and I can tell you before I leave this sighting, I'll, you know, I'll tell you what I think Tingana dreams of, like now. Definitely, I got like two dreams at the moment that are crossing my mind that maybe Tingana dreams of. So tweet, tweet, hashtag Safari Live, and all the other viewers, let us all join Laura in thinking when Tingana sleeps, what dreams do we think he has? Give me one dream each. I got my two, I just want one from you. And hopefully all will be good dreams, eh? No nightmares at the moment or today, eh? Thank you, Kasti. As the answers will come, I'll be more than happy. I have my two answers ready, but I'm not ready to give them away until I get one from Laura and a few others. Lala says, Lady Leopard, yes, I think so too. And a good looking male like Tingana uh, definitely should have such nice dreams. I agree with you totally. And that's pretty close to one of my dreams. I'm still holding mine close to my heart. But thank you for that, Laura. Don't touch that doll. He is dreaming of impala sandwiches. That sound 
perfect that sound perfect of course he already got the impala up there what he'll just need to do is get a few leaves of the brown ivory tree or the magic inguari and some tomatoes i think from some cucumber or some other fruit and he'll make himself a wonderful sandwich that sounds like another interesting dream <laughs> Billy, <laughs> you're saying Tingana is dreaming of ice cream because it's hot. I think you could be right. But Billy, tell me, what flavor? All right. Billy, do you see Tingana appreciating you? And like, yes, Tingana thinks your dream is sweet. And there's a Franklin there just going crazy. You think you can hear them? They're just communicating with another flock. Billy, what do you think? I have a question for you. What flavor do you think Tingana would like of an ice cream? I agree with you because it's warm and you can see him panting. What flavor would you like to offer? If I give you a choice, Billy, what flavor of ice cream would you want to give him? Look at his eye. He's looking at you, waiting for your answer. Pocked by the crested Franklin there. I'm still waiting for answers. I'll give you one of my dreams of the two and one of them is I think Tingana when he sleeps he dreams of getting threatened by one male leopard by the name of Hukuburi. I'm not sure that's the correct pronunciation but one of my thoughts of his dreams when he gets a nap or at night, he dreams of the day Hukumuri will give him a standoff. I'll let you know of the other dream later as I wait for yours, but occasionally we have seen leopards playing or jumping to insects. Look at these cool little spot, um, butterflies. These are one of the whites, I'm pretty sure. They're not the brown veined whites, but I think it might be, the, it's definitely one of the white species of butterflies. There are a lot of different kinds of them, but they, they're all coming in onto this uh, little flowering plant here. And obviously we can see their little proboscis going down into the flowers. I don't know if Craig is able to show you there, but their little curled up proboscis is going in and over here I'm also getting a little Mopani bee oh there he goes he's just flitted off but he'll be back I'm sure and everybody taking advantage of the little flowers that are coming through here it's um it, it's obviously that they hatch around this time of year or metamorphosize into the butterflies for this specific reason uh, coinciding with these different plants that flower at this time of year it's fascinating how uh, the timing of of metamorphosizing and things hatching normally coincides with the host plant and it is very intriguing that now in autumn uh, we've got very few flowering plants at the moment there's a lot of flowering gr grasses uh, but not many flowering plants and these butterflies are obviously very imperative for the pollination of these different flowering plants and um, without them they wouldn't be able to survive either so it's a obligatory mutualistic um, relationship between butterflies and these flowering plants and it's wonderful to see them up close like this all flitting around there's a lot of them in the in this particular area also down just in this drainage line that's why i like walking in these particular areas there's all sorts and over there we've got some other little kind of insect as well oops i don't want to disturb them but just over there craig that that's a it's almost like a mayfly but well maybe it is a mayfly it doesn't look i can't see it from this angle it's just in between the two butterflies there as well normally yeah we could have the mayflies hatching definitely because we are in may so you know i do quite a bit of fly fishing and that one looks similar to a mayfly but they normally hatch in uh, 
very big numbers. Oh, there's a little moth down there as well. Not only a butterfly, here's a moth over there. Uh, he shouldn't be out at this moment in time. You see him there? Just at the tip of my stick. See, a moth is different to a butterfly, that their wings don't close at the, uh, uh, in the middle, and they're normally nocturnal. Uh, this one is obviously out during the day because he's taking advantage of these flowers here, too. But that's definitely a moth. There's the other ones, are the butterflies, and then that maybe, maybe mayfly is also up there doing his thing. But there's all sorts, a whole entire ecosystem going on around this little flowering plants. And I'm sure that there's some ants that are getting in on the action as well. But that's why it's lovely to be out on foot, because we get right in the thick of it, and we get to see these smaller things that we normally drive past when we're out on the vehicle. Oh, that moth's on the move. Maybe he's getting ready to fly off. Rainer, these um, these plants, it's, it's not a nettle, um, but... Uh, it is one of the pioneer plants around here. We often find them next to the road and so on, but I'm not exactly sure, and uh, it's quite bad of me because there are quite a, a lot of them around at the moment. So I actually need to take myself a little sample. And what you want to do now, obviously, because there's lots of butterflies enjoying these flowers, I might just take myself a photo of it. But normally, if you want to get a little sample, you just take something that is quite indicative of the whole plant, and you can normally take it back, and then you can check it in your little books and so on. But I'm going to just take a photo of this one. It's got very... Um, characteristic yellow flowers. Oh, he has a little spider. It looks like a crab spider. See that there, Craig? That's a crab spider. And why are they called crab spiders? Because Not because they walk sideways, but because they've got very clear crab-like legs. And it does look like a bit of a crab, but he's a tiny little one. He's just going underneath the flower there. So I'm going to take a... Oh, and he's come this side now. Let's see if we can just get him back onto that side just to have a look. There he goes, onto the tip of the leaf. There he is. See, we're getting all this little macro stuff here now. And I'm sure the spider will maybe be eating some of the, the nectar as well. I'm not quite sure. But also maybe making a little nest here because lots of insects coming in to uh, get the... the the nectar from the flowers so he'll be taking advantage of all the insects coming in as well so that's why i say a whole ecosystem around one single plant or a little group of plants i'm going to take a photo and i'm going to be a dotted blue james richard saying a dotted blue okay they do have a little bit of a dotted oh well they're very dotted but they there's no blue on it um, but thanks james richard for telling us which uh, butterfly this is. I often just, um, when we're out on bushwalk, it's difficult to carry all your books with you. So we just um, take some photos of them, and then uh, this one just drinking a little bit from the flower as well. And you see how they close their wings? That's one of the characteristics of butterflies. That's different to the moths, where the moths sit with their, their wings open and flat. Is there a spider there, Craig? Is he further up or down? Oh, that's also a little one of those little crab, crab spiders. There, he's got a little web there as well. Oh, it's fascinating around this plant. So thanks, James Richard. Dotted blue, hey? They, tiny little butterflies. There's all sorts going on here. You could sit here for the whole walk. We wouldn't be walking. We'd call it a bush sit. <laughs> But it's fair. And there's also all the little blue grass, all sorts happening in there. And as I say here, it's nice and wet. So there's a lot of moisture in the corner here by the rocks coming down this drainage line. So these plants, very pioneer type plants, and I have seen them next to the road, as I say. So often in disturbed areas or, or areas in where you've got your initial soil coming through, these plants come up, they stabilize the soil, and uh, then you have all sorts of little seeds and things dropping in underneath here. And then you have your, your first part of your succession stage uh, moving along in a little area like this. 
Now, we're going to continue on this walk, and what I'm looking for as well is along the banks, there's often little holes, and there can be all sorts of little critters in there, but I'm hoping that we can find some birds' nests, especially the kingfishers, who have all left now, but we'll be able to have a look inside their little homes. So, I think let's carry on down the road, and uh, well, while we're looking and searching for something exciting, let's head you back to David with Tingana. Walking on the road sometimes is very productive because when we have the guides looking down with a game scout, they'll always spot trucks, say for example of cats, either lions or leopards, and they tend to follow them. And if they see them from a distance, be it a leopard or some pride of lions, they'll always call us and we give you a closer and you know a better profile of these cats. Well Tingana, my good friend, is still enjoying the best of his snooze and I'm sure you've all been thinking what other dreams you think could be going on in his mind. Billy, thank you for coming back. Thank you very much, Billy. And I think strawberry ice cream sounds good. And Billy, you know what? I rarely take ice creams because of where I've come from, but any time I have a choice of a flavor, I'll always go for strawberry. Very good. Strawberry, I think. Tigana, what do you think? Yeah, you see, Billy? He just moved her left paw to, like, tell you yes. You see, Billy? Right. He's just answering you, yes, saying strawberry is good for me. I hope, Billy, you got the answer, or you got the acknowledgement from Tingana himself. Keep sending me or keep uh, sending your tweets on what you think Tingana would be dreaming of. So I already told you one, that to be concerned that one day Hukumuri will come and try and get him or dethrone him and get him out of the stage. And the other dream I think could be going on in his mind is thinking of other predators, for example, hyenas. Hyenas, if you get a pack of hyenas, for example, say five or six, a pack of six or seven, comfortably can try and intimidate uh, Tingana. The only challenge would be the hyenas will not be able to go up the tree. If anything, well, let me see. You see how high he is? At that point, hyenas will not reach that kill. If anything, I would guess lions might. Lions might try. Once in a while you've seen them climbing trees and trying to intimidate the leopard to get out. So that could be another second dream I see going through Tingana's mind. So send me a few more dreams that could be going through his mind when he sleeps. And he just rolled over. Look at that fog. And like all of us, when we have a nap or when we sleep, we turn our bodies just to make sure we've got a good balance. Kia is saying he's dreaming of a jelly steak. Well, steak sounds pretty good. It got venison now. And yes, he could possibly be dreaming of a steak. Why not? I've always liked when leopards have choices of say an impala or a warthog and in their mind maybe i think for the next kill what will i go for will i go for venison or will i go for pork because this kill i'm sure by the end of today it will be done and he, he is like mm, for my next hunt what do i go for I still want to believe they want to change the menus. They don't want to stick with venison throughout. They also to want to try and do something like pork to give a good balance on their bodies. He is huge by any standard, this boy, eh? I'm just... <laughs> Scott, <laughs> you're, you're saying you're saying Tingana is dreaming of Shidulu. I would say yes, because from what I saw yesterday, Shidulu is a very beautiful girl.
she is beautiful. And at four years, I'm imagining by the time she gets to five, she'll be stunning. She'll be stunning and looking very, very beautiful. So while that sounds like a good dream, and Tingana, just to let you know, Shidulu was spotted this morning, quite a distance from where we are, and yeah, Shidulu could be a good choice when maybe she comes in Istros, and Tingana knows she might get a cab with Tingana. Heavily, heavily breathing. I still think she got quite a good amount of uh, proteins in his tummy, and that's why he's not interested to go for anything at the moment. But I'm sure as it cools off, he'll give it a short climb and eat his meat before it gets, you know, gets start getting bad. It's still very fresh to me in leopard standard. I highly doubt I'd go for it myself. But we'll wait for Tingana until he turns around and decide to go for his impala. The Franklins once in a while keep calling, keep calling, and Ruff could be looking for some Franklins or their trucks. Well, everyone, I'm just, um, I'm just having a look in the side of the banks here, as I was saying, because these are the kind of little holes that all the little kingfishers also use. Uh, they make these, and uh, they will then use these as their nesting sites. And it's it's incredible because that that goes as deep, at least as far as my stick. So that length, at least, and then it turns a corner. So I've never actually looked inside one of these, and. It is fascinating because you can actually see on the sides here where the little bill of the woodpecker, uh, the kingfisher, has actually scraped this hole. It must have taken a long time for him to build this. And it's fascinating to see how deep it goes inside there. And it must be quite um, sort of solid substrate because otherwise if it rained, it would collapse. And this is very hard here. And they can very often come back year after year and use the same hole, quite similar to that of the swallows um, who will build their, their little nests out of mud, but these kingfishers will go into the sides of banks like this. Now, obviously can't see, there's no uh, sort of spider webs or anything on the inside, so I'm not sure if this is being used at present or not, but it's... Uh, Yes, Kia, I'm going to be definitely careful of snakes. That's why I've got my very strong torch with me, so I can always see if there's something sinister that's going to come out and have a look at me. And why I also don't go sticking my head down art fork burrows, because I know that uh, it's a favourite hiding place of the black mamba. So anyway, that's very fascinating that we're going to keep on looking for these little holes and things. It's not easy for Craig to get up there with me, um, but uh, we need to carry on. You can see there's a lot of these holes along the bank as we move along. Now, Jackie, there's not a lot of birds uh, that nest this time of year. Um, so the, all the nesting would have been done already, um, and the animals, the birds, they're now sort of uh, just carrying on the winter. Uh, they're preparing for the winter. A lot of them have already left, especially the migratory birds. Now, I'm not going to be asking Craig to follow me over this while he's uh, holding the camera because he's going to fall over. But um, so that's the thing. They're not going to be nesting at the moment. That would have been done uh, later in the season. So as we sort of head into maybe August, that's when they'll start again to make these kind of nests. September, um, then obviously heading into spring, that's when we start hearing the, the woodland kingfisher returning and those kind of birds. And uh, that's when there's real excitement around the birds. They start the nesting process. They're building them. They're uh, trying to attract a mate uh, and, and etc. 
So at the moment, it's all just trying to get themselves some food. There's not a lot of birds calling at the moment, no territorial calls. And that's why uh, I was even saying, if you try to call a bird at this time of year, they don't generally respond. So uh, it's quiet time in terms of birding, uh, but we do get to see the obvious residents that hang around. And uh, one of them being, we just saw one fly over, we tried to spot him. Uh, but it was a brown hooded kingfisher. Now, I've got another one of those ladybirds that's just come onto my finger here, and he's just flitting around. Well, it's probably a female, and this one is just sitting still enough. I'm still not convinced that these are la actually locals, but um, I could be mistaken. I know that there is an exotic one that has been uh, spoken about recently, and they've been attacking our local red ladybirds. And this one's just getting ready to fly now. You can see when they spread their wings. Oh, no, he's gone back. He's gone quiet again. Maybe he thinks I've got some aphids growing in between my hairs, or living in between my hairs, I should say, because they do feed on aphids. So they can be quite useful in a, in a garden at home. They do assist in keeping the little pests away from your vegetables. So that's why it's important not to put herbicides and pesticides on your vegetables. You, you rather want to attract um, the biological insects that will come and help assist in keeping the pests away. Now, we're going to carry on, see what other interesting little things we can find. Back to David and Tingana. Yeah, Ralph, keep looking for all the small and the big things you'll see. We have wonderful weather today and it could be, you know, anything out there in the bush. And our flat Tingana, boom, just there. He relocated himself again, changed position by about one meter and then slept. And we're still waiting for him to go up that tree. On all my dreams, I also got another dream that he wakes up right now but that is in his dream and finds out his impala kill is not there and i would want to ask you a question between me and fag who do you think tingana would suspect is the culprit between me and fag who do you think tingana would be, think is the suspect <laughs> Kasi in Final control says definitely fuck. Fuck, I don't know what you have to tell that girl when you go back home later in the camp. Yeah, because I always steal Kirsty's dinner. Uh, <laughs> and to you viewers, I'll tell you what. And uh, yeah, Fag has owned up and has said, uh, you know, he's always sneaking on Kirsty's dinner. So, Kirsty, thank you for being honest. And also, Fag, thank you for owning up. And to you viewers, you all know Fag very well. So you tell me what you think. Just tweet uh, to us on hashtag Safari Live that if Tingana right now could be having a dream and thinking his skill of Impala is gone when he wakes up and the only life he would see here or the only people he would see here is me and Fag, would he point a finger at me or at Fag? Tweet hashtag Safari Live. I'll be waiting. Got a lot of flies there that keep irritating him. See him moving his paws and uh, just flicking his ears. Patrick, how are you today? And have I ever seen, or would you like to know, have I ever seen a leopard with two kills in one day? Sorry, Patrick, I don't think I have. Walking back, all my years out in the wilderness, I've always seen one kill at a time. The closest to that, Patrick, that I saw was about, uh, you know, 10 days ago, when this magnificent Tingana you're watching now had two kills which were about 300 meters apart. And both of them were two male impalas, and we had a few theories, maybe he snatched one kill from another leopard and most likely a female or a younger male, or he had two kills. That's the closest I've seen a leopard with two kills. I've never seen a leopard with two kills on the same tree, but there could be a possibility. The 
only worry would be if he got two kills, would he be able to eat them and, you know, finish them on good time before they get bad, you know, before they get spoiled? I do not know. But I'm sure if you pick, you know, a leopard could pick them up on a tree and don't open them up, most likely they might last enough uh, for him or for her to eat them, say, 10 days or so. Such a possibility would happen, for example, if Tingana has the kill he got now on the tree here, the impala, and some other prey, be it an impala or a warthog, passes very close. I'm definitely sure he'll go for it. If an opportunity comes, most cats, lions, cheetahs, you know, leopards, will also bring the prey down as much as they'd be having another, you know, another prey. They're very opportunistic predators. They'll just keep the kill and, you know, for what I would call for a rainy day. And they know they'll not waste so much energy, to, or, you know, won't spend so much energy trying to bring another kill if they can easily get one. All right, Taylor, tell us what you're looking at at the moment. The sky, there's a silver lining. It's beautiful, isn't it? Don't you think? Wouldn't you like to have that as a live wallpaper on your computer? I would. I think that's very cool. Panning exactly like that too, David. Does it get to a point and stop? And then it's and then, it's, and then it swings back again. Very cool though. <clears throat> so we thought we'd show you something pretty up in the air. Um, I don't know where we're gonna be going now. I think maybe what we have got a school drive the last 45 minutes, so just uh, keep that in mind. Um, so I'm thinking maybe I'll try go look for Shidulu. So we'll perhaps head towards the west. I'm wondering, I think we'll probably head to Chitwa a little bit later. If we don't get lucky here, we'll just give Shidulu a bash. What was walking? Was that? What was that? Something was on the road now. I don't know if it was a warthog or a daker or a baby leopard. It's gone now, whatever it is. I don't think we'll find it. I think it was actually a Dacre. I have a suspicion because it was quite gray. I haven't seen a gray leopard before, not even the old ones. Um, so anyways, now I don't know if anybody told you, I got so excited, I was racing off to Bivol's Hook Dam. You maybe were wondering why I kept saying to all of you, there might be some surprises at Bivol's Hook Dam. Well, I was really hoping to show you Tundi. But Tandy's not actually there. She's in Biffle's Hook, north of Biffle's Hook Dam. Went searching around, checking all the trees, going, where is this cat? Looking for fresh tracks, vehicle tracks, leopard tracks, anything. No, she wasn't there. So she's not far, though. And I wonder if Biffle's Hook Dam isn't the closest source of water. So we'll have to be checking there first thing in the morning. I'm going there. That's where I'm going. Shotgun now. Anybody, if you get all my witness tomorrow morning, I'll be heading to Biffle's Hook Dam to see if Tandy has come through to have a drink. So that's exciting. We'll get another update tonight. I'm pretty sure uh, Tax, Aubrey, Rexon, everybody will be heading in those directions. And if, um, well, I'm sure they'll be happy to give us an update. <clears throat> so that's quite cool. That's quite nice. Down cheetah cut line we go. David, I think we might do mum. Mumba? I think we went past Mumba. You're quite right. We might have to just do Gauri Main, actually. There's no, there's no saving us here. We might just have to do a little boundary patrol. It's all right. Really cursed. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to find anything with a heartbeat. Let's see what we can find. Except that Dacre that just ran down the road. Silly, didn't want to even stay for a quick look. I haven't seen one bird yet. 13 rainbow. I'd also like to see some more elephants. That herd that we found, actually it was the end of the herd. Oh, David, what's this row? No, this is Mamba. Mambo number five. It is, we didn't miss Mamba, so we're safe. We don't have to go on that wonderful road, Gary Main. We might see some elephants down here. This is quite a nice road. And then we also go down into the Muluati, and I'm definitely starting to notice a trend really with the elephants as they do every year, is now that the grass is starting to change color, although it's changed back to green. Can you believe it? It's not yellow anymore. It's amazing how it just recovers over, over a couple of days, over night almost. But it will die down again fairly quickly. 
just spruced itself up quickly. And uh, the elephants always do it. So once all the grass is down down, it's not green and lush and juicy anymore, they'll start feeding down towards drainage lines. And that's what they've been doing. So the Molwati, which is a dry riverbed. Hi, Hormel. Wait, let's have a look here. Finally, finally animals. But we will head to the Mulwati in search for elephants too. But first up is some red-billed hornbills. Thank you very much. Whew, can take a breath now. When I do those DNCs, those drives and chats, sure, it's exhausting. No, I'm just joking, it's not really exhausting. I can talk for days. I think people wish I wouldn't. Kirsten says it's exhausting for her to listen to me talk all the time too. Please help us. So if you would like me to stop talking or stop talking nonsense, you can. You can save us now. Even that bird just put its wing up to say, yes, please tell us how. All you have to do is hashtag Safari Live with some questions or chat to us via the YouTube chat and then I'll stop talking absolute nonsense. How's that? Synchronized preening? <laughs> well, the music's not great. I could work on that. And also, they don't seem to be doing it together very well. Perhaps they're just starting out, they've just joined teams. And while well, Hornbills are monogamous, I suppose, yes, they are a team. It looked a little bit like David there, doing yoga earlier today. <laughs> Coast Rider, not Coast Rider, I know it's Ghost Rider, isn't it? Spook, Spook Rea. Because <laughs> it's <laughs> Coast Cider? Coast Binder? <laughs> okay, so I don't know. They, it literally sounds like you're saying the same thing over and over again. <laughs> she just said the same thing. She's literally just repeating the same thing. Coast Cider is what I'm hearing. Like a uh, cider apple? Like apple cider vinegar okay coast cider there we go we've got your name i don't think i've been calling you ghost rider this entire time. <laughs> let me just apologize uh on behalf of my, well, myself and i'm pretty sure everybody else has heard something quite similar i also love hornbills that's what you were trying to say <laughs> i love it i think there's going to be a sequel to that uh, the video fc put together uh, so funny about um about the well the presenters mishearing because i've had some crackers this week anyways off you go to ralph now i think he's pondering about what he's going to have for dinner tonight at a pan <laughs> I, i'm not looking for anything to eat around here chiller pan is a rather uh sort of stinky smelly water at the moment because it's quite interesting you often see uh, elephants buffalo rhino in water drinking it and while they're defecating and urinating in the same water and chili pan is right now it's like um, it's quite pungent it, it, uh, it it's almost like a soup um, there's uh, yeah there's obviously water to be gained here and you can drink it uh, I wouldn't as a human but uh, the animals can although it is full of urine and and poo as well now next to the water here is quite interesting because we've got rhino tracks but we've also got a mixture of rhino and elephant tracks in this particular area but that's not what i want to show you at the moment what i do want to show you is something that's quite interesting just a little bit away from the water here and that's these scrape marks which when i first walked up i, I didn't really understand what was going on here and Often you've got to sit and just think to yourself, what kind of animal would be able to make these big scrape marks like this? And I was watching this morning, there were those elephants that were just underneath Tingana, and one of the elephants went and he, uh, the, one of the youngsters, and he stuck his tusk into the uh, side of the termite mound, he loosened up some soil, and then he was taking that soil with his trunk and throw it, throwing it on himself. He was also actually eating some of it. Now, this you can see here, this is a young elephant that has obviously put his tusks in here and he's scraped forward and then he's gone on with his left tusk and he's scraped here it looks like he's picked up some of the soil with his trunk that there to me looks like a bit of a trunk 
uh, impression and he's sort of scraped it a little bit and either fed on it or thrown it over himself and you can see in this soil here there's a lot of mineral salts so I'm pretty sure that it's quite uh, there's a taste to it as well and he's continued scraping with his left tusk very very interesting this and also interesting to note that uh, elephants they can be left or right tusked like we would be left or right handed I'm right handed my little boy is left handed but um, elephants you can actually look at their tusks and you can see by which one is worn the most um, and you can see then oh he's left tusked instead of left handed left tusked but very interesting that we actually seeing the signs here from them probing the soil with their tusks picking up some of that soil as we saw over there and either eating it or throwing it over themselves so wonderful little uh, evidence that's been left here by the elephants next to the water and I find it fascinating looking at the tracks and signs of different animals uh, and what they leave behind and then leaving us to try and make the story of what has gone on but uh, and with having seen it this morning very fresh in my mind and I did see the kind of marks that they left as well and this is almost identical to what uh, happened just below Tingana while well, he had jumped out of the tree by then but uh, below that impala that was hanging in the brown ivory so that is wonderful it seems the elephants have moved off this is not very fresh it's when the soil was a little bit wet so it's hardened now um, and uh, well these elephants aren't here now and we've got our game scout Ephraim looking out for us so luckily we can continue to walk and continue to look for tracks and signs of other animals as we move along so I wonder as we move along here if um, Tingan has actually gotten up is he still being a lazy boy well Ralph uh, just keep walking and maybe you might find another leopard that's more active than our Tingana here. Still sleepy. He has changed position two times and apart from the flies that are irritating him, he is flat, flat, flat. And that's uh, a very, very, you know, it's a very typical behavior of leopards. If they're full, they got food next door, why bother keep moving around and either way it's a bit warm now the, the sun seems to be coming out than earlier before you can see from what fog is showing us there sunlight coming through and i'm sure it might warm up a little bit so leopards i'm not surprised he may choose to stay there another half an hour another one hour and then go back to his kill hoping the ellies do not come back here because they're here it was quite dramatic this morning how they brought him down from that, uh, you know, brown every tree for his dear life. And I'm sure as he kept going away, he, you know, he was wondering, hopefully, he will get his kill back. I would wonder what leopards think or how they would relate with big animals like elephants, because maybe they have known, you know, that as much as he had to leave he definitely knew very well the elephants are not going to touch his kill so i wonder what kind of thinking or what thoughts goes through them in their heads just to know yes these animals here the elephants are herbivores and whatever happens they'll eat the fruit or the leaves or the brown every tree but they're not going to touch my food i would imagine you know how he would be able to do that and he came right back and that shows me the you know the high intelligence level of the animals here in the wilderness otherwise if for example there are lions i would guess and he knows this are my competitors i highly doubt he would even make a u-turn or think he would get the food back so maybe he chose you know a better bet let me come down Elephants do your thing. I'm sure you, even if you're gonna shake the whole tree and my food comes down my impala comes down You're not going to touch it, and I'm sure I'll be back And I think that's very intelligent of you know, animals like leopards to know You know herbivores will not do anything to it is food Keeps panting there breathing moving 
is paused once in a while, depending on what these irritating flies are coming to his ears or the eyes or the nose part. Had a very good chance earlier to see the five patterns. Ron, you're asking why Tingana is breathing so heavily, and I'll tell you, number one, you can see that it's more of panting than breathing. And this leopard brought down a very huge female impala two days ago. And he must have eaten a lot. So it's a combination of the amount of food he got in his belly and the heat of the day. So that makes him to breathe or pant that way. If he was not that full and not pretty warm as it is now, I can tell you the panting or the breathing would be a bit slow. So there's a lot of digestion going on at the moment. And we're just hoping more food will be digested to create room for him to go up that uh, brown every tree and get a few pounds or ounces of the impala kill. Or he may also choose to go for a drink, which would be a very good thing to see him move around. Shidulu was quite entertaining last night and this morning, and both of them had kills. And sometimes when you look at leopards, I'm not sure it's because of the size. Shidulu being a female, maybe she may choose to get smaller kills, maybe female impalas. And yesterday she got herself a steenbok. So and if you compare a steenbok to an impala, Steenboks are much smaller, way smaller than impalas. And maybe that may explain why the males are bigger, male leopards stronger, and they would equally go to a prey that's proportional to their body weights. I would imagine the bigger the leopard, the bigger the prey should, would be. And the smaller the leopard, for example, uh, the females would go for small game. Similar case to lions, if you see lions, when they bring down a big prey like a buffalo or a giraffe, males are always involved. But when you get one lioness, chances are she'll either, if she is, you know, single-handedly, she can bring down even a zebra or a wild beast or a hard beast or a topi. But when it comes to big game, like buffaloes or elands or giraffes, Always, and in most cases, males are always involved. They need that extra muscle to bring the big prey down or just to subdue it to bring it down to the ground. Others, females generally will not be able to do that on the self. Oops, sorry. That Franklin spoke to me, scared me, and also made Tingana wonder who is that trying to come close. Tingana just rolling around there and just doing some nice yawns. Look at that. You could do better than that. The beautiful Taylor Makuri is still out and about. I don't know, did we have an option to go home halfway through the safari, David? <laughs> and to stay out the whole time. But we enjoy being out here. We've got two impala rams, and I thought that this was a, an interesting scene, not just because that impala was grooming itself, but because they're two fully grown rams. And at this time of the year, although it should be ending soon, this time of the year we normally see them, well, the rams clashing horns, as we have been watching over the past few weeks. But when there's no females around, there's no need to fight. And... I think that's what's happened here. They're both tolerating one another. They've actually, maybe they were, had territories that were just sort of, uh, well, quite close to one another. And they thought, well, why there's no breeding herds through here? We'll give our horns a bit of a rest, our heads a bit of a break. Imagine the headache you must get from ramming into one another. And, um, well, we best um, watch each other's backs because there's lots of leopards and lions and hyenas and all sorts of wonderful things that would want to eat them. So... They will do this from time to time, but as soon as a group of females shows up into this area, well, <clears throat> they won't be friends anymore. That's for sure. Oh, that's quite cool to see. They're beautiful boys. That's something we should ask David. What does he think about the impalas? 
Because, I mean, in body size, they, they're big. Maybe they're not much smaller than the, the, ma uh, the Mala. <laughs> the Impala in the Mara. That was going to be a tongue twister. But they definitely, in the Mara, have a much wider splay of horns. Almost twice that. What's caught your attention? I thought I heard something whistle. But to be honest, it sounded more like a bird than anything. Now, great question from Gary. Um, it's quite simple as to why impala and other animals, because other animals do will walk up to a predator once they've spotted it. So it's not just leopards. So if you are shouting and you are shouting, hey, I can see you, you know, or whatever your term may be to shout at an intruder or somebody that would want to eat you. I haven't ever experienced anybody, uh, well, wanting to attack me, so I don't really know what I'd want, what I'd shout. But the impala shouts something regardless. And whether it's one animal on its own or whether they're in a herd, the impala has got a better chance of getting away and that leopard knows it. The leopard has to get, or that lion has to get within a certain distance if it has a decent chance of catching its prey. But if its prey has spotted it and is now shouting and telling everybody else in the area that there's a predator around, that, um, well, it's going to march towards it and say that. You're going to act confident, show, say, I'm not afraid of you. I know that if you try and charge me now, I'm going to outperform you. I'm going to run away from you. I'll jump higher than you can jump. So that's basically what they're saying. I once had a really cool sighting. It was actually with Impala. I was watching them as the sun was rising, and the next minute a beautiful big male lion came walking over the crest. It was kind of something like out of a movie. And then he started roaring, and he roared, and the Impala knew that, no, this lion is not interested in hunting. I think he's trying to re relocate the females, and this group of Impala walked right, in, right next to him, maybe only a couple of meters away, and they didn't care. I've never seen such brave Impala. It was probably the closest I've ever seen predator and prey and that and I was quite early in my guiding career and I was quite shocked I thought okay that's very close I can understand 50 or 60 meters away shouting but you know just a few feet that's impressive that is the expression not well I suppose he's concentrating but that is the face that an impala pulls when he's using the luxury facilities but he's finished now I wonder if there's a little midden forming over there just hidden in the grass. That's something else that's exciting that we're going to see as the grass starts to disappear or die down. We're going to see where all the middens are. Lots of more. Uh, we'll see a lot more dung. I don't know how excited all of you are about seeing more dung, but uh, definitely for us it's quite nice. We're able to see where elephants have kind of moved through. Because if an elephant just goes through here, you probably won't see much. I mean, elephants can defecate everywhere, but if they didn't walk on the road and leave their footprints on the road or pull down half a tree, you're not going to really notice that even the elephants have been through an, an area. But, again, as the vegetation starts to disappear, these sort of very obvious signs, we'll be able to see them in winter. Lots and lots of things to look forward to. I think I've forgotten how dry it can get already. <clears throat> the Mara was so different. Even though the Mara were there during the migration, and I got there towards the end. Oh, there you went to Dacre. I don't know if you saw it. Did you see that thing go? You might, just a flash. So there are lots of them running out. Kirsten's saying, don't lie. Why would I talk nonsense about a Dacre? Okay, it's gone now. Yeah, I promise <laughs> it wasn't my imagination. There really was a Dacre that just zooted across the road. Should have showed you its tracks, hey. Oh, I forgot to tell you what we were even doing while we're driving in this area. We're going to go look for Shidulu now. And we're going to try and find her, hopefully. And then uh, there was a bit of mixed communication, which is why I wanted to bring it up again. Is <laughs> I, s I bumped into Ralph on Bushwalk a little while ago and said to him, and we're having a chat, and he said, how, how did David get to Tingana when he had Shidulu? And I was going, I don't know. I was like, I was all fair for a little bit. I was like, I'm not, I'm not actually sure what happened there. And he's like, no, oh, no, one minute he was with Shidulu, and then the next he's gone. And then I asked Kirsty, who's directing, I was like, did David have Shidulu at any point? Also, because I wanted to now find out where was she, because I'm quite keen to go and see her. But, I, you know, thinking she's probably going to give me the slip. Anyways, it wasn't. It was David on a termite, termite mound, a Shidulu, talking about Shidulu. So there was lots of broken telephone that went on. And what else happened, David? We saw crested Franklin chicks. 
very briefly. How cool is it? It was so cute. <laughs> oh. I don't. James, I actually don't know anything more, but we're going to solve that problem right now. Are you ready? We're going to send a voice note. Who are we going to send it to? Shall we ask... Shall we ask... Sheldon? Now, let's ask... Let's ask little, little Leo Smith. Hi, Dylan. We're live right now. We would like to know more about the encounter between Hukumori as well as um, the Anderson male. Please could you fill us in? Thank you very much. Okay, bye. There we go. Done. We will find out. I will keep my mobile device close in case he replies. So, well, stay tuned for the inside scoop in the Sabi stand because we will be hearing back from little, little Leo Smith. I keep messing that up. I'm just going to stop calling him it. Dylan. And uh, let's see if Rolf has found anything interesting around Pangolin Track. Everything off. Okay, everyone. So I'll just stop you on the road because this has been a subject of discussion. Um, because I think Steve spotted Tingana um, dropping the scat on the road. Um, so the question isn't who who pooed here. <laughs> we know it was Tingana. The question is um, who flung this dung? Well, we know who flung it. It was Tingana, but. The, the question remains what he ate because we're seeing a lot of small tiny little bones here that would really indicate a small animal however I have dug out here and I don't want to touch it with my hands because of that streptococci that uh, you can get that forms a cyst on your brain uh, so I don't want a cyst on my brain but the question remains are these claws or or are they the, well, nails, claws, or are they the outside parts of a hoof? Not a hoof, uh, you know, the, the two um, toes of, a, of an antelope. So that's what the difficulty remains here, because it, it, Brent seems to think that this, uh, that Tingana ate a civet, um, which is possible because of this black hair. This is what is confusing me. But look at all of these tiny little bones. These for me don't indicate a civet. But a lot of black, black hair. And it's thick hair. So, and also these, so th th there may be a few animals that has been passed at the same time. I'm not quite sure if these are nails or if they're the outside of a hoof. I still think that it's the outside of a hoof. But there's quite a, a number of them, so I might be completely wrong. You see, there, that's a lot smaller. I'm just trying to see if I can find another part of a, of a hoof or nail, um, and I'm just digging through it. But this is, still remains a bit of a mystery as to what Tingana had been feeding on, especially with a lot of this black, thick hair that we're looking at there. It, it, it would, yeah, maybe honey badger, civet, I don't know, but with all of these small little tiny bones here, it's almost like he's eaten some rodents or some something very small as well. Because these are complete little bones there. Look at that. That is a complete bone. It's got the two joints on the end. So it's not as if it's part of another uh, or just a broken piece. There's another piece there, and there's another piece there. So this, for me, remains... A mystery. Ravinda, you saying porcupine? Mm, Ravinda, I don't think it is a porcupine because uh, we wouldn't be seeing this hair yet. I know it's black, but porcupine, they've got quills. They don't have hair. The quills are modified hair, but they don't have little hairs like this. So I don't believe it's a porcupine. But I don't have the answer. So Ravinda, I'm not uh, writing it off. All I'm saying is I don't believe it's a porcupine. Linda, you saying a mongoose, or maybe a white-tailed mongoose, potentially, but it still doesn't explain these tiny little bones here. That's the problem for me. So whether or not it's had a big feed, and then it's gone on and ate um, something big, uh, as, uh, lots of small little things after that, I'm confused. I'm confused as to what he ate. 
Brent is convinced it was a civet. I'm not convinced there's potentially a civet and maybe something else. Um, but they could also, yeah, that's left for me. Ivy, you saying a bird appetizer? There's maybe another little claw there. Ivy, uh, yeah, there could be bird in here, but I still think maybe rodent. And then, yeah, so let me just, I don't want to get that nasty bacteria. There's another, you see, there's completely different sizes here. So that now does go closer to Brent's theory of it being uh, something like a civet, because that now sort of refutes my, my claim of it being the outside of hooves. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm stumped. I'm stumped. Project Alpha, you saying the little bones possibly being forming that of a longer tail? That's an impressive theory, yes. Uh, we would have to obviously put them all together and see if it would form a nice long tail. I'm not going to sit here for that entire process. But um, that, is, that is a reasonable pro, uh, um, theory that you're saying. But there's also tiny little bones in here. So I, I think, you know, we could possibly line those up <laughs> and make a tail. But uh, Simon, you're saying a honey badger. Absolutely. With this black hair, it's potentially a civet honey badger. Um, with those claws, you know, honey badger, they have those three very long claws in the front, which we are seeing on the one side there, those that could potentially be. Um, but that white-tailed mongoose, I think, maybe is a good What do you think, Ephraim? Yeah, white-tailed mongoose, you see You say white-tailed mongoose or civet. So Ephraim's going with white-tailed mongoose or civet. I'm seeing there's another little claw in there. Okay, now that looks like a real kind of nail and I'm saying it wrong it's not claws it's nails yes so look at that that's almost like a, a shark's tooth and it had the little cover on it as well so the keratin on the outside so these are now guaranteed those are little claws little nails so that is correct not the outside of hooves all right so we can write an antelope off um, civet honey badger white-tailed mongoose Hmm. Interesting, hey? Lovely to look at things like this and try and work it out. But a lot of black, black, black hair in here. Tingana, at least you've gone on to better things with Impala and stuff that you're eating now. Because this is, uh, you know, Mustelli Day, if it is a honey badger, they're all the smelly things. And I think that's scraping the bottom of the barrel a little bit. If he did go after those, he probably ate it with very long teeth. You know, when we say that, you're probably uh, uh, eating it like that. Linda CSI Safari. Exactly. That's what we're all about here. Digging through dung, checking out tracks, see what the animals have been. Especially after Steve watched Tingana walk up the road here and defecate. Flung his dung here on the road and left it for us to come and scommel through. And that's an Afrikaans word. To get into the nitty gritties and move around on the inside and try and work out. Because we didn't see him eating it. So we can try and put the evidence together. Philip, you saying a hyena newborn. Whoa, yeah, you see, now this is what I like. We're getting the real theories in here, and it's not proven. So it could well be a young hyena, because they are black. They're very black as well, and there's potentially that, uh, you know, they, although they're pretty much straight black, and there's quite white in here too. So I don't think you're right, Philip, but uh, as I say, I can't prove you wrong. Well, Tina, looking at this, and thanks for your question, they don't particularly break down keratin that well. So keratin being obviously very prevalent in, in nails, but it's also very prevalent in hair, and, and, you know, nails is basically condensed hair, very similar to our nails and our hair. So they obviously with that, even though they do have a very strong stomach acid, do leopards, they don't break down keratin very well. 
Um, and that's opposed to hyenas that will break this down. Uh, you won't get to see things like this uh, in hyena scat. Uh, it's literally all digested. And that's just because their stomach acid is potent and it will break this down completely, including teeth, which is remarkable. But with this, this leopard, uh, they pass the bone, they pass, they don't pass all the bones. They obviously do digest a, a bit of it. Um, but you can see that, look at those bones, they're almost completely intact. And uh, the hair as well around it. So mostly the meat, the actual flesh part of things and, and the organs, they digest very easily. And that normally comes out in the first defecation, the slop of the blood and the flesh. That will be the first defecation. Then it slowly but surely hardens up. So by the third, fourth scat, this is what we, we, we sort of uh, left with. So this is the end part of the digestive system. And now the animal has completely been passed. Um, and this is when we get the real kind of evidence, is that last scat um, as it's passed through the entire digestive system. But it's fascinating. And, uh, well, we don't have a conclusive answer, but uh, we've had all the theories. I'm going with Ephraim saying white-tailed mongoose or civet, which is what you said. Hey? So, that's it. So, from the poop that Tingana dropped, as Ephraim also has a look and sees if he can come up with any other theories, let's head you on over to the man himself. Yeah, Raf, you have uh, to prove to Tingana that was him, you know, who left that uh, pool there that he was around that area, and maybe you have been able to very, very uh, closely identify what he had eaten. Here, if he's going to do a pool, I will tell you for a fact, 101%, it will be from an impala kill. No doubt about it. What I usually wonder is how the poo would look like from, you know, leopards. When they eat domestic animals, I'm talking of them when they eat, say, dogs. Like where I come from in my village, they used to attack dogs and they could come and at night enter in the villages, our dogs could be seen missing the following morning. I would wonder how that pool would look like. They could also go for chicken and goats and sheep. And because they had to eat in a rush, sometimes they, they ended up eating a bit of fur from the skins of the goats or the sheep without, you know, being able to skin them very well. We're just hoping here Tingana will rise, maybe do a bit of scent marking, because most leopards, when they scent mark, they could either urine mark, scratch, but again, the same pool Ruff is talking about, they'll always drop, you know, some scat somewhere, which will also be a very clear indication of marking territories, which I think Tingana is doing so very much the last uh, few days because of uh, Hukumuri. Three days ago, when we saw him walk, he sawed, and that's the last, you know, the, the last sawing I've had for a leopard after a long, long, long time. It was so, so loud, you'd feel like it was just shaking the whole bushes where we were, which is, I would say, also very territorial. And just remaining Hukumori, well, yeah, I could be edging out, but as I'm still at my best, and I'm in charge, and I'm the Duke of this area. Very adaptable cats. They would survive anywhere you would think in the world. Well, Savannah, you'd like to know how long until he hunts again. If the Impala will take him maybe today through tomorrow, the day after, or maybe the next two days max, Savannah, I'm sure he'll go for another kill. But you notice between major meals, leopards will always have small snacks. I'm talking of getting small reptiles, for example, either monitor lizard or a skink or a lizard here, or catching a bird like a Franklin, or for example, let's say a uh, guinea fowl. So between main meals, and main meals I'm talking of either impala or baby nyalas or baby kudus, between that time, the lilies go for other smaller snacks. And if he gets another impala today, I can tell you, Savannah, 
he'll go he'll go for it eh? comfortably not because he is hungry not because he doesn't have a kill but as i said earlier leopards and muscats are very opportunities and if an opportunity swings by welcome and i'll just put you in the fridge up there on the tree eh? some of the places where we also know leopards exist like southeast asia or in Korea. I do not know some of the viewers would tell me what they think they eat in a place like Korea. Here we know the impalas, we know the antelopes, we know the birds we got, or the reptiles, they have a lot to eat. But I gathered one time way back, we got leopards in a place like Korea. I'm not sure it's North Korea or South Korea or both, but what would they be eating there? In Southeast Asia, we have had because most of their natural prey have always been wiped out by man. They have been known to go for man, and now they got man eaters, leopards there, which in the villages you don't see them during the day, but at night they are seen by people. And every few weeks you hear someone was found killed by a leopard or a child is missing. I would imagine what they used to eat before and what might have happened because they may need to strike a very good balance of the leopards there and not have them eating human beings. Okay, Tingana, that is enough sleep. Rise and do something. Got your meal. Good yawn, stretch. You walk, we'll give you space to walk. So long as you don't go down again, Tingana, please. Run, how close is David from Tingana? One, two, three, eight and a half, eight and a quarter meters, Run, Eight and a quarter meters is where I am from Tingana. 23, 24 feet. How does that sound for you? Would you like to come and join me and we watch him together? So he just repositioned himself slightly close to the keel and sat down again i'll also do the same and see whether he has put his head down or he is looking at the kill we are not leaving tingana and taylor do you have any update for us no i don't have any updates for you not yet i still have not received a response just yet from little leo smith so we're waiting for Dylan to reply to find out more about the story. If push comes to shove, I might have to tell you tomorrow morning about what happened. Um, so we're going to show you the sky. I'm just trying to hide away from the power lines because we were on the power line road trying to find Shudulu, who apparently went further west from where James had her this morning. So we're doing basically a check around to see if we can pick up on her tracks, but so far no luck. But isn't that stunning? Literally just a gap there between the very, very dark clouds for the sun to poke its head through. But sadly, not too many birds chirping to go along with that. Otherwise, I think that that would have been an ideal moment to just, well, take a breath and l listen. I suppose we can still do that, hey? Some birds that you might be able to hear are the turtle doves, a.k.a. the ring-necked dove, or whatever you want to call it. Not really, you can only call it those two names. I was just joking. You don't get free reign and get to just make up new species names for animals. That's not allowed. Okay, right. Let's carry on. So we're heading towards Impala Plains now. The only problem is, is that the light is starting to fade, which is not ideal for tracking. So we've just had a quick quick look down the power lines road and I think if we don't find anything here, any tracks, although this road is not particularly great for tracking even when the light is good, she could possibly still be here or maybe, maybe she's actually gone 
even further than this and just followed the, it's a massive block it's a huge area and just sort of carried on towards triple m which is one of the boundary roads and then crossed out that's a possibility we keep i mean if i was a leopard and i've just eaten a big meal i need something to drink and david is actually not as far as what we thought hey eh? between zoe's road and there's some pans that are around here. I know, just because I've seen wild dogs drinking at them before. I'm going to stop one more time to have a little look at the view. It's also a nice time to have a listen. Is that rain in the distance, Darby? Look at those big dark clouds just over the Drakensberg mountain. It looks like this might be some rain. Wow. Now, Bron, unfortunately, the animals can no longer head towards the Drakensberg Mountains, which is the, the range that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, there is a big fence that stops the animals. But otherwise, yes, the animals can move around uh, within reason. I mean, it's a massive area. They've got 8.5 million acres of land to traverse on. Obviously, we can't drive on all of those 8.5 million acres. However, it's free for, well, the animals to move around. Within the Greater Kruger system, there are private game reserves, or well, obviously private landowners, and, and then a variety of different game reserves that have... I suppose different traverse agreements, um, but th that of course doesn't go for the animals. Wherever there's an opportunity and there's no fence, they'll move there. If it means new water, if it means better grazing, that is where they're going to go. Obviously, not obviously, because you might not actually know this. I'm sorry, I was very rude. I didn't mean to say that. I was saying obvious. I don't know why I say use obviously sometimes and it's wrong. I need to stop. What I was going to say, Bron, is that some of the animals actually hold territories, which is kind of the animal that we're looking for. One of the animals that hold territory that we're looking for is, is the leopards, is this leopard by the name of Shidulu. And she's just recently taken up residence around here. So we haven't quite figured out. We know she's not going to be going to the Drakensberg mountain for crystal clear spring water. That shan't be happening. David, I haven't seen any tracks, although we could have just driven straight over them. This light is really not amazing. Oh no. Tula Ann, why did you do this to me? I thought you were my friend, and now you're saying, do you know the words to the gummy bear song? No. Not very well, but James does though. James does it the best. And you know, Tula Ann, I do lots of crazy things. Let's be honest. It's me. But I don't know if I can stand up and uh, to James's gummy bear performance. I, I think it was just the best gummy bear performance I've ever seen. They might even bring back the gummy bears just be, and James will star as all of the gummy bears. I mean, we really need to watch out that he doesn't decide to leave Safari Live to, to, to be the new gummy bear show. I mean, there's a, there's a huge possibility. I'm joking, of course. James is not going anywhere. James has got his feet firmly on the ground here. He loves us all too much. It's, he says it's the people that keeps him here. <laughs> you know what my favorite thing to do is put words in people's mouths and uh, and then they can't defend themselves. Because I know James is sitting in final control right now. He's writing his report. He's now typing in capital letters like this. <laughs> Reprimanding me. Oh. Oh, no. And apparently he's now saying, no, he does agree. Is he not an FC? Kirsten's telling big stories today. Big, tall tales. Hey? He was in final control though at one point. He might actually be watching in his room. Maybe he's watching on his computer. That could be another. You never know when James is watching. You've always got to make sure you're giving 150%. <laughs> for a leopard so we've been looking david's been keeping an eye out while i entertain all of you while we have nothing thank you david so, so much fun to work with i'm sorry to Anne. next time i'll try and think of something that james hasn't done yet okay maybe maybe you must have a look at the worm video we did that was quite funny right but well david saved the day of course because he has got tingana and well it's getting to that time when you should be waking up <laughs> yes, I'm um, giving account to Tingana of one to one to a thousand. I've counted 300 now. 
I got 700 counts to do. The only problem is I'm counting them in my mother tongue and repeating them at the same time in English. And then Farg is also helping me to do the same. So I'm counting to a thousand and Farg will count from a thousand backwards. Fergus needs to count with his fingers, so he's running out of space. <laughs> That's the challenge, and I'm sure you heard what Farg said. He need to use all his fingers and all his toes to get to a thousand. And Tingana has no reason now to rise and shine. She just moved a little bit to that position. You look in front of Wahoo there. I'm not sure even Fagi can get anything there or even this. Can you, can you even get, that's just the ear, right? That's just the tail. Yeah, or the tail there, which sometimes they use as a follow me sign. Yeah, well done. And the times that flick of a tail comes in very handy for us when we are trying to look for these beautiful predators out in the bush. And once they flick it up, we are able to see them. And I don't know what Taylor is thinking doing a caterpillar dance. The other day, she did very well with James. I'm not sure who won. Maybe because you'll find out what the viewer said. And I would say the best bet is maybe tomorrow or the day after. I'm also given a chance to do my dance and then you can play the videos to all the viewers and then can decide who will have done the best, you know, the best dance, uh, not forgetting the other presenters in the Masai Mara. Sorry, Kasti, Kaka age five would like to know what about the mouth closed? Sometimes pant with their mouths. Um, they, they, all right, Kaka. I got your question. Sorry now. I got your question now. Why do leopards pant sometimes with their mouth, their mouths closed, Kaka? I hope that's your question. And if that's the case, is I would say if they got so many flies irritating them, as you've been seeing on Tingana the last few minutes, they do not want any of the flies maybe going into their mouth. They may feel quite irritated and opening the mouth like dogs, what they have done once in a while when they're panting or when it's hot, and they put their tongues out, it makes their life easier. So for leopards, it's a bit strange if, you know, they would do that, not opening their mouth, unlike the dogs. And just to make clear difference, dogs being dogs and leopards being cats, maybe their breathing could be a bit different. So they may want to close the mouth and maybe it's easier for them to pound or to pant when they have, say, their mouths closed, unlike when they got them opened. Dogs, maybe you realize they'll open their mouth, and when they're panting, they got their tongues out, and sometimes they've been known either to lose heat or to sweat through their tongues. Leopards, I highly doubt that could happen because leopard tongues are very, very rough, and when they're serrated, they use that to marinate or just sometimes to cut the fur or the hair out of the skins of their prey. So I think their tongues are rather rough and will not be very good or do not help them putting them out and helping them say to sweat or to bring their temperatures down. So to them, if they close their mouth or they open, doesn't make a difference. And I think it's a lot easier for them just to have them shut and be able to punt. What do you think, Do you think he made a little move there or not? He's trying to rise up and every time there's a Franklin next to it, he moves a bit, then he goes right flat down. Should be about five o'clock now, Central African time. And I think for, since for the time we've been here, should be a time to wake up. Right, you're asking if leopards, males or females, do anything like raw. I do not think so. That I've only got if you're talking of the cats with the lions only and not leopards. Leopards, you know, will sow, will growl, you know, snarl, you know, those are the kind of calls or sounds leopards make. But I do not know of a leopard or leopards, you know, roaring like lions. If any other animal I know roars once in a while, but it's not a cat, 
will be the impalas and most of the male impalas. But leopards, I do not think, Rero. Come on, Mr. Tingana. You've been there for so long. It's time you moved your big body. Otherwise, your meat will go flat, eh? Or the alleys might come again. And I'm sure if the elephants come again, I highly doubt Tingana will come back here. He'll have learned his lesson. There's something that elephants want on this tree, and most likely they'll keep coming back. And he better chooses, uh, you know, get another prey and, you know, host it on a different tree, not this particular type of uh, the brown, gray, you know, brown every tree. So flat. It reminds me of Shidulu this morning, the James. At one point, James got frustrated by Shidulu and was like, Shidulu, you're leading me to a snooze or to some kind of coma because she was doing a lot of nothing. But with the love I have for Tingana, I'll keep here as long as it takes. If we look to the left, there you can see Fag. Is only skin now left of the impala. There was the stomach contents there yesterday and the day before, but what's left now, I'm sure the hyenas must have come for them, or even maybe jackals. What you can see there are the fruit that were dropped down earlier by the elephants that were here in the morning, and all what's remaining now is far. I do not know whether anybody would come for this remaining far. Maybe hyenas will always go for anything. But that tells you how the dynamics work here. So the leopard knew, Tingana knows his food is safe up there, but down here anybody can come and swing by but not touch the impala on the tree. Very bold, cut and versatile leopards are. And looking at the sizes of, you know, cuts of the leopard size, anything leopard coming down, I think the most successful cuts are leopards and they would survive in any vegetation in any habitat you'd think of. I'm talking of uh, even some rainforests like in Africa, the equatorial rainforest. We don't get anybody smaller than a leopard surviving. Yeah, that kind of vegetation, they are very good. Fag, leopards will survive. It has been claimed, you know, they'll go to very high elevations. We've got a mountain here in Africa, very, very tall. Uh, it's called Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm talking about 19,000 feet, 19,000 feet. I mean, I've been up on that mountain a few times, but I haven't seen a leopard myself, but it has been claimed leopards would be living on those very high mountain forests. You'd imagine 18, 19,000 feet, a cat surviving there. So leopards will adopt where other, I would say, larger predators will not be able to survive. What is interesting, when you see them there on any very high, high mountain areas or places of very high elevation, they do not look like the leopards we have here or like Tingana or Shidulu who have very conspicuous and clearly marked body patterns or rosettes you'll see them all looking in one color they all look dark like jaguars they don't have the patterns well the patterns are there but it's a typical hybrid in color and you'll not be able to see the patterns on them not sure what taylor is doing at the moment maybe just driving around looking for something maybe i think most people are wondering what i'm doing with my life driving around in the wilderness watching two hornbills i thought we were going to see a fight but they seem to be very sweet with one another this pair don't you think just preening pecking off the same sand it's all very romantic here today the little birds i don't know if that other one pulled a dine and dash and now he's left with the bill i don't know <laughs> did you just regurgitate that seed and then eat it again okay interesting Normally they will regurgitate, well, some, sometimes they regurgitate big seeds that they, they don't need anymore, but I can't say I've ever seen them just eat it again. Maybe it wasn't quite finished with the digestion process. Nibbling on something, though. I wonder what's there. I wonder if it is a little berries or... I can't see any fruit trees. Oh, no, now they're gone. Bye. 
Bob? Yes, birds do have a sense of smell. I'm not sure exactly how keen it is, but there will be some out there that will use it to try and help uh, them find food. Uh, it's, so, something quite cool that some of the birds have with very long bills. I don't think hornbills have it, but something like a hardy dar ibis or any of the ibises or um, even the wood hoopoos that have got these really long curved beaks have a sensory nerve that runs down it so that's kind of like a really cool sense to how they can feel vibrations so any insects and things that may be moving in the ground or perhaps wriggling around uh, in some wood they'll be able to sense that and I'm sure they must have a, a decent sense of smell perhaps it varies from bird to bird I, I suppose it also depends on what they're feeding I mean how much use would a sense of smell be for say something like a turtle dove that's pecking seeds and they just peck the ground all the time I don't know if seeds give up much of a strong scent but um, yeah I suppose it might depend on what bird it is anyways we had no luck with Shidulu we didn't do a proper search though we did just have a quick scratch around but uh, school drive is going to be starting soonish and I'd like to try and get towards a Chitwa Dam and watch those little hippos play I think we're definitely going to be seeing that this afternoon. Is it? Cor it's not correct to say. I think we're definitely going to be saying that, seeing that. I should have just said we'll definitely be seeing that because those hippos are just fantastic at that dam. And what else might we see? Yes, Kirsten. I know I struggle to speak English. We know this. I've never hidden it. I've never pretended. <laughs> I just was kicked out of class too often. I didn't get to, uh, taught properly at school because I was literally, I was always sent out the classroom. Taylor out! Oh, that was not my, that was my Afrikaans teacher. <laughs> so that's Taylor out. Yeah. You know, I don't know. The teachers loved me. Uh, like they really, really enjoyed me, but they also really disliked me as, you know, I didn't get expelled from school. That's for sure. <laughs> Okay, so we've just jumped out onto one of the, the main roads. This is called Gauri Main for all the new viewers. And you will, it's quite easy to tell the main roads because uh, they've got these power lines that run along them, most of them, I suppose not all of them. And it's a lot wider than the normal tracks that you see us driving on. And that's of course because there's big delivery vehicles that need to bring us all the delicious food and well, all those kinds of things so they need an easily accessible road and then of course most importantly when the guests come through and they're not flying in then to drive in but it gets you somehow can't just walk your way in anyways we're not too far from Chitwa now so we'll keep on making our way there let's go back to Tingana um, I'm actually not sure what's happening there I wonder if he started nibbling on his carcass yeah, Chitwa is one what hole that I love and it's full of activity for more the hippos there, the crocs and all the bird species is one place I love and I would imagine maybe one day I'd be happy to see my friend Tingana in there having a drink and that should be one other exciting moment for me. Well Tingana is still staying put and not interested in us, not interested in his skin. Darkness is slowly coming in but I'm still very convinced before we leave here he'll go a bit of a nibble because we need someone to entice us to think of dinner Aunt Jo you are asking would a male leopard scent mark where a female leopard has done the same absolutely a hundred percent and especially when you know they are starting to mate or when the female is coming you know in estrus he will want to do the same so that if the female will pass by the same spot it will be very easy for her to know what could be happening Tingan is rising up slowly and yes I would say male leopard would do the same and it just be leaving clear indication to the female if anything happens I'm around here or I passed here and we can always you know meet around the corner and have a drink and make a plan eh? yes that happens a lot and Tingana I would say is a classical example from what I saw a few days ago doing exactly that Tingana, I'm not understanding you today. 
I'm not sure I can hear him part from who I am or whether he's dreaming from all the dreams you have been talking about. Fuck, what can you hear? No, I can't hear him at all. Ha 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 Fuck is like, Tingana is very typical. That's very usual for him just to go flat. Aha. Mm, mm, uh -huh. Fuck agrees, but from what I saw of Shidulu, Shidulu is like, I would say, elephant. She, she doesn't stop. She's one girl who is here, there, looking. The longest I saw her have a nap the other day was like 10 minutes. But either way, she'd still open her eyes, turn around, swing the tail, swing the head. But this boy here is of very different behavior. And I think the two, two leopards that are the same is just flick the tail and well that should be a hippo maybe not a leopard but Tingana you need to do something because we have been waiting here for long it's all patience when you're out here you are never in a rush the animals will do what they want and patience counts a lot Some birds that are nocturnal now coming in slowly. Is the time we'll start seeing the night just come in. We'll start seeing bats flying in the air. Maybe some rabbits, scrub hairs also. Yes, thank you for that. And we have to be patient. I have no choice. You can see the clouds there. They're building up early in the day. It's a very dark cloud. I'm not sure. They might translate to anything at night. Three days ago, we have huge rains here. Very well done. Good job, Fag. Is that beautiful? Looking very grey. Very good. And hello to all the school children and a very big welcome to our sunset drive and today we got uh, the Shauna Me Seneca from Canada is returning school welcome back we have the Horizon Elementary Albana first time you are with us well well welcome big welcome and we also got the Hamptons Oak Elementary from Virginia Beach and to all of you a very warm welcome to our Sunset Drive. We are broadcasting to you live from Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. And my name is David, and the man filming with me today, his name is Fag. Very nice gentleman. And we might surprise you by telling you what we have in store for you as we start this show. Because we got a cut, we got a spotted cut for you, and it's called a leopard. I'm sure those who are with us before have seen leopards. If not, now for all the three schools, we'll have a leopard. Is in that grass you see there. It doesn't look very, very clear, but if you look carefully, very good. You can see something breathing. You can see some spots there, and what we are doing is just to wait for him. It's a male leopard, and his name is Tingana. What we request you to do through your teachers is to ask us a few or as many questions as you'd like, and also give us your thoughts and feelings. I am not alone. There's another girl by the name of Taylor and another boy by the name of Ralph. Now, let's hear what Taylor has to tell you. I will tell you all the cool things about coming on a safari. But as David said, my name is Taylor. And then we've got another David. We've got David Squared today because David is also on camera with me. And I'm very, very excited to have all of your questions come through today. So remember to ask me as many as you can. Now, I wonder what the time is where all of you are. I bet it's different all over. But here in South Africa, it's that time of the day where the sun is starting to set. And, well... The predators are going to come out now these impala which are the animals at the back that you can see the lots of them are and then the others warthog now they need to be very careful especially around a watering hole and Mo, you've asked do the will we see more animals because the sun is about to set um yes and 
don't know. I suppose we could we could start to see a lot of animals that only come out at night. So for instance, something like an aardvark or an anteater or a porcupine or a, what else could we maybe see out here? A civet, yes, that's correct. Janet, I mean, these are all really strange things. I have a book that I can show you all these animals. So we could see some like really cool different creatures at nighttime because for instance, that warthog, he's not going to stay out here for very long. He's going to find his home soon. I think he's been having a great day wallowing in the mud at this little pan. I'm sure he's had a drink and now he's trying to just get a little bit more food before he has to go to sleep. And I don't know if any of you will guess where this warthog has to sleep. Can any of you guess where he, can, where he has to sleep? Richard, you've asked if these impalas are going to get eaten. Maybe at some point, but for the moment they're still fine they're okay but it's when the leopards and the lions come around even the hyenas and the cheetah that uh, well they can find themselves in a bit of trouble but you see there's lots of them there they've all got well there's lots of eyes lots of ears looking around so i think it will be quite tricky for a leopard or a lion to stalk and to try and catch these impala but when the sun goes down, it's obviously much better for the leopards and the lions because their eyesight is way better than the impala's eyesight. So that's pretty, pretty good for the lions and leopards because they also need to eat. So these animals play a very, very, very important role out here is that they turn the grasses and leaves into protein that the uh, lions can feed on. That's very cool. Kirsten, please can I have that question again? Look what I want to show you very quickly. Look down here. Look here, that's a civet. Now, that's a funny looking creature. This is one that comes out at night and then I'm going to turn the page. Look at this one. This is the other one I was telling you about. This is a genet. This one likes to climb trees. They're really good at climbing trees. So we have genets and things out there. Now, very nice. Okay. I can't remember the name. Was it Sebastian? Sebastian? I think it was Sebastian. We're winning. Sebastian, I know the warthog's just hidden away at the moment. But I think you were thinking of the Lion King when you asked if that warthog was eating grubs. So they sometimes can, but at the moment, oh, there it is, it's just popping up past the impala. Is it eating grass? They love grass, they love grass roots. And it was quite funny, a few weeks ago we could see the warthogs sticking their heads quite high above the grass. And I was thinking to myself, what are they eating? Why are they doing that? That's so strange, because the grass was quite tall. It's like they were on their tippy toes. They were eating the grass seeds. So I thought, oh wow, they don't waste. They eat the whole plant, but at different times of the year. Because at different times of the year, the grasses will taste different. The seeds will be better after rain. The roots might be nutritious now. And I don't, well, I don't think there's too much nutritional value. So when I say nutritional, I mean good, good sust. No, sustenance is also not a really good word to use. I'm sorry. Good uh, vitamins and all sorts of minerals and things that these animals will need to survive. They come from all the plants because that's what they're eating. And then, like I said, then the lion or the leopard, if it wants to get the vitamins and the minerals, I'd will have to eat all the impala or warthog. Why the animals? Awesome. All right, I believe we got some guesses. Shanton. Very good guess. You said in the grass. They don't sleep in they don't sleep in the, the grass. Sometimes if they have a, a, a little nap during the day they might. And then Richard, you guessed in the water. Oh, it would be really cool if a warthog could sleep in the water. We're going to see an animal soon that kind of looks like a warthog under the water. And lure you guessed in the mud. Almost, not quite though. So they kind of live in something that's made of mud and soil. They live in termite mounds most of the time. So there'll be these big burrows that say something like an aardvark or the anteater has dug. And the warthogs will go all the way in there and sleep inside that. So any burrow into the ground is where a warthog loves to sleep. Isn't that cool? But I can hear some exciting things coming down from the distance. There's a big watering hole just down over there. And uh, there are some hippos. And I don't know if you heard them, but I could hear them calling. So I think we're going to race there and hopefully have a look at some. But Ralph is in the tent and he's got his microscope. I wonder what else he's got to show you. Well, hello and welcome to all the kids. 
I'm in the tent. We're in the bush still, but I've come into the tent because it's getting rather dark now, and I don't be want I don't want to be out there when there's lots of predators around. And my name is Ralph Kirsten, and well, we've come in here just to get away from all those predators, the lions and the leopards, because as soon as it starts getting dark and the sun goes down, well, those predators like to wake up. So we need to be very careful, especially when we're out on foot. Taylor and David, they're out in the vehicles, so they're okay. But with us on foot, we need to come back and sit here in the tent. But I've got lots of exciting things to show you. The first thing I want to show you is what you've been watching out there. This is a skull of a warthog. Look how big it is. It looks very small when you look at them out there in the bush, doesn't it? But when I put it next to my head, look how big he is. He's rather large, isn't he? So even a warthog I would be scared of. Um, but luckily, they're scared of us when we're walking out there. So they all run away. And that's really lucky, isn't it? Oh, Harleen, I don't know what is coming out of the warthog's mouth. Ooh, oh, this over here, that's its tusk. You see that? And this is a skull that we found in the bush. So the other one is broken off, but this is a tusk. And you know what that is? It's actually one of the warthog's teeth that has just been modified. So it grows out. And why do warthogs have tusks? So that they can protect themselves against leopards and lions. It doesn't oil always work, but I tell you, it's a good weapon, isn't it? Because if that had to hook me by the neck, it would really hurt. So those leopards can really, uh, they need to be careful if they want to eat a warthog. Now, we also do have other things. Now, Mika... Um, well, the the, um, the warthogs, they also uh, try to keep away from hyenas as well. And they'll use their tusks to try and keep uh, safe too. But what the warthog does is he goes inside his burrow at night. And that's when the hyenas are coming out. So luckily, he normally misses the hyena because they're out during the night. And the warthog is deep down and safe in his burrow. So luckily, that's what they do. But now another animal that you've been looking at is the is the impala and remember the, the female impala she doesn't have horns like this one does this is a male impala and he's got the big horns it's almost like antlers isn't it but remember these things that are growing on here they only grow on here after uh, this animal dies and the these are little worms that go in there and it's actually a worm that comes that goes into a moth so it's very interesting isn't it uh, Hardit, they look like deer because they're not, they, they're almost in the same family. They're like distant cousins, uh, but they don't have antlers like deer have, you know, because deer, every year they replace their antlers, they fall off, and then they grow again. Well, Impala, if one of these breaks off when he's fighting with another male, um, it's not going to grow back. So he needs to be a little bit more careful than the, than the deer, because they just grow them every year. But the Impala, he only gets one set, so he needs to be really Really, really careful and I tell you what I've got all sorts of other different skulls to show you and there's one in particular that I'm going to show you very soon but before I do that I'm going to head you over to the very animal that I'm going to show you the skull of skulls are very educative to you children to all of you nice kids and I'm sure Raf will also show you a skull of a predator or a leopard or a lion or a hyena. Predators are animals that eat other animals and what we have now is a predator called the leopard. As I said earlier his name is Tingana and we have been following him and he has a kill and Fag is going to show you the tree where his dinner or his food is. I'm sure it could be in the morning there, but here where we are is about 5.30 p.m. Central Africa time. So you can see it's getting a bit dark and inside somewhere in that tree there's some nice meat for that leopard.
Laftash you like to know are leopards omnivores? No, leopards are carnivores. And I'm happy or I would imagine you know the difference between the two. What Fag is showing you there are the remains or part of the fur or the skin of the meat or the animal or the prey that's up on that tree that the, the leopard will come to eat later. So leopards are carnivores and carnivores are animals that eat only meat. Omnivores, I'm sure you know, they are animals like us who will eat both meat and anything green. Just to educate you, herbivores will be animals that will only eat green things or sometimes herbivores, we also call them vegetarians. For example, elephants or buffaloes or antelopes or the poor impala that is being hanged up there by this beautiful leopard. And what we are doing, we are just hoping he is going to wake up and go up on that tree and maybe we'll see how he eats his dinner, how he gets a fork and a knife using his teeth or holding it with his paws as he eats and enjoys his dinner. So remember, as we said, through your teachers, send us as many questions as you can. Ralph want to show you more exciting things from the tent. Now look at this, everybody. That leopard that you're looking at with David, well, this is a skull of one. And look at those teeth. So a leopard needs to have very big teeth like this one's got so that it is able to kill animals like an impala. Look at those big teeth in the front. Those ones there are used uh, to help kill the impala. It will grab the impala by the neck and bite in deep and hard and then it will suffocate it, which is not very nice for the impala, but the leopard does need to eat. So he will kill that impala as quickly as possible and so that the impala doesn't suffer as well. And once he's killed it and he drags it up into the tree where it's safe away from lions and hyenas, then he can start to use some of the other teeth that he has on the sides there because those are like knives. You see as it closes, that helps the leopard be able to cut the meat on the sides there. And those are called carnassial shears. And then right at the back, he's got some crunching teeth, almost like our teeth in the back of our mouths, that helps to crunch the bones and make it easier for him to swallow all that. So very, very important different teeth, hey? Now, Kifa, these animals, we didn't kill them, I promise you. We found these skulls in the bush, and they were already dead. And normally, we would leave these skulls out there because there can be all sorts of little creatures that maybe live inside the head of the skull afterwards, like little insects and uh, centipedes and millipedes and all sorts. So normally, we leave it there, but we wanted to bring some just for you so that we can show you exactly exactly what a leopard skull looks like. Now, Kelly, a leopard skull is so circular because they need to be very, very dynamic. They need to be able to be uh, stealth so that they can go low in the grass and they can be very, very quiet and they can also not be seen by the impala or heard by them. And when they need to go, they can run quickly for the impala and catch it before it knows that it was even there. So the impala normally dies very quickly and sometimes they were just eating some grass and very quickly the impala was dead. So don't worry, the, the leopard is actually very kind. Even though he kills the impala, he's very quick at it and the impala never suffers. So very, very nice skull of an impala uh, would be eaten by this leopard. But um, in the meantime, I'm going to look for some other little skulls to show you and we'll talk all about it. Let's head you on over to Taylor, who I think is next to some water. 
We've made it. We made it to Chitwood Dam. But before we even have a look at what's at the water, I found you one of my favorite birds. Now, the reason why they're my favorite is because they are so funny. They can't help but do something silly which will make you laugh. But they are getting ready for bed, kind of like that warthog, except these guinea fowl are not going to be living in a burrow underneath the ground. Instead, they kind of fly like chickens to the tops of the trees where they will sit and sleep for most of the evening. Look, there they are. They're like Christmas decorations in that tree. That's not a very nice place to sleep. Well, look at all those thin little branches. I suppose it's a safe spot because I don't know if a leopard would be able to climb up there. So maybe I would have been eaten if I was a guinea fowl because I would have chosen, cho not chosen, I would have chosen a tree with much thicker branches to sleep on. And maybe, maybe that would have... I would have been eaten. Can you hear all the birds chatting? That's so cool. But they all get ready. They're going to take their time. I don't know if there's going to be space on that tree for all of them. They might have to find another spot. But there are a few little places that they like to sleep. But look at all of them up there. Now you can't see it now, but they're actually black and white. So they're completely black. Well, not completely black because they've got white little dots covering their body on all their feathers. They're very pretty. I might even have a guinea fowl feather for you. While you look at them, let me see if I can quickly try and find one for you. It shouldn't be too far away. I have lots and lots of different types of feathers. Jobin. Now, you've asked if I think that these uh, guinea fowl are related to turkeys. No, I don't think so. <gasps> I just broke it. All my feathers are falling out now. Oh, no. All of them. I hope I haven't lost any. Now, where is that guinea fowl feather? That's not it. It's a very easy one to try and identify. <gasps> No, come back. Oh, no, I'm going to lose my favorite feather, my kingfisher feather. I'm going to have to find a new spot to keep these. But look at all of them. Oh, here they are. Hi, guinea fowl. Any one of you want to give us a feather? No. No one wants to give us... Oh, they're a little bit scared. As you can see, they're all flying past me. They don't trust me. I think they think I'm going to eat them. Now, Sebastian, thank you for all your questions today. You've asked, what are the predators of the guinea fowl? That's a very good question. So, leopards snakes even a young lion would try and eat a guinea fowl big birds of prey so raptors so types of eagles would want to eat them but i think at night they'd have to be careful of the leopards and the young lions but like i said sitting up there they should be nice and safe for a while but that's a good spot to sleep but there's other things remember i told you about the hippos where are the hippos? I hope they, I was hoping they were going to be nice and close. I can hear them splashing around. David, can you see any hippos? Can you? Oh, there they are. See, we've got the special light on, the infrared light. No one's opening its mouth. And you can also hear the hippos. So we've got this special light which allows us to see them in the darkness. Kiefer, I think that you are spot on with your question here. You've said, are hippos fat because they eat too much food? That's exactly it. They eat way too much grass. They need to slow down. I'm only joking, of course. Hippos, there's no such, actually, there's no such thing as being fat out here in the wild. Because if you have got a lot of extra weight on you, it means you are healthy and you can, well, you are able to survive through the droughts. So the droughts when there's not a lot of rain and then the water holes can't fill up. So it becomes a big problem. So they actually are better off. And I, I can actually say I've seen a thin hippo before. It was very sad. We had big droughts here, 2015, 2016, and I never thought that I'd ever see a thin hippo. And it was very, very sad. There was no food for them to eat. There was no grass around because that's what they like to eat. We actually might even see them come out of the water to go and eat grass. And they were having to eat rhino's poop to survive. How crazy is that? Because when rhinos go to the bathroom, they, they, well, they leave all their dung in one spot and then the hippos were like well there's nothing else to eat we have to eat it it was very very sad to see but that's not the case at the moment we've had lots of rain you saw how tall the grass was the animals are very very healthy at the moment so all these hippos are living in a family and i think soon 
they're going to come out. Now, Caleb, another good question. You've asked if hippos are related to rhinos. No, they're not. They're not related to rhinos. They look. They look kind of like big rhinos. Imagine a hippo with a big horn on its face. That would be quite cool. But no, they are not related to rhinoceros. That's very cool. We're, there's lots of hippos here. I think there's one that's going to pop out quite close to us. We're just trying to find them. Boomy, now you've asked if the hippos will take their babies into the water to train them. They have to learn. So I suppose when a hippo is born, they're normally either born in the shallow, just in the shallow waters or out on land. Mom doesn't want to be too far away because she's very, very vulnerable when she's out on land. And sadly, if a, a little hippopotamus is going to die, normally it's just after it's been born because something like a hyena or a pride of lions will try and catch it. And then mom panics and she's all by herself and this is not very nice for her. So it's quite dangerous. See that hippo is coming closer now to the edge of the bank. Um, so they, it will take them some time. It naturally instinct though so they just know how to do it and I suppose that kind of happens with human babies too I've seen some really cool videos where don't please don't actually I'm not even going to tell you never mind but there's some the I suppose natural instinct is with all of us but um but these little hippos will be fine but mom will keep that little one in the shallows so mom won't go venturing out to the middle of this dam she'll probably stay quite close to the water's edge so if that little one gets a bit tired it can well it can probably stand so she'll do that now this is all awesome and we're going to sit and wait for them to come out of the water and while we do that i'm going to send you to david who's got a very very sleepy leopard hopefully the hippos will come out of the water and you'll have a chance to see them and sometimes when you're out here in the wilderness patience is very important so Taylor may have to stay there wait and wait until maybe if you are lucky or she is lucky the hippos will come out of the water and it's the same story here with me I'm waiting for this cat or for this leopard to rise up and then we can give you a good view of how a leopard looks like you may notice now your screens may look a bit different now they look like black and white and what we have done now or what Fang has done now is to change from color to what we call infrared that would mean for you to see them we don't shine very strong light to the leopard and then you'll be able to see the leopard nicely and Catherine you'd like to know would a leopard eat plants if there was no meat once in a while we have seen leopards eat grass so I'm not sure they would eat it to fill themselves but sometimes they'll eat grass maybe just to help them in digestion but very very rare for them they would eat plants to survive if they would entirely maybe not get meat I think they would at the end of the day die after a long time but what you're asking if a leopard is a fast is fast as a cheetah well you'll be surprised to know both of them are cats and the cheetah is almost two times faster the cheetah is almost two times faster than a leopard Imagine a car when your mom or your dad drives on a big road. So a cheetah can do about 110 kilometers per hour. 100 kilometers, 110 kilometers per hour. Well, a leopard just does slightly half of that. And a leopard would do about 60 kilometers per hour. So cheetahs are smaller and they're faster. And the reason for that is because they go for different foods. Cheetahs will go for smaller antelopes, more so called the Thompson gazelles. And those Thompson gazelles are very swift, they're very fast. So the cheetah has to be equally fast. Leopards do not give a chase to get their food. Leopards will stay somewhere, like dogs, will lay an ambush, or will stalk 
the prey very quietly, going very low in the grass, and then they just pounce or they just jump to the prey. And if they do a long chase, it's only maybe 10 meters or 20 meters, and that's it. That's why both of them have different speeds. Cheetahs a lot faster than leopards. And Taylor might will want to show you a bird now. We did, we did want to show you a bird, but unfortunately it is, well, it has wings and it flew away. It was too quick for us. It was a little heron, but it's okay. The hippos are still playing around, so we've still got them to chat about, which is quite nice. Now it's getting very, very dark and, and the hippos are sitting a little bit far away from us, so we're not going to be able to get any closer. Nash. Now, you've asked if hippos can see well in the dark. I think that they can see well enough. I wish I could be a hippo for a day and give you a very accurate answer. I, I don't think their, their eyesight is, well, exceptionally good. I think that they, they'll be using their sense of smell, so their nose, and I think they also listen out. They use it, well, I suppose they use a number of their different senses. But I don't think that their, their eyesight will be too bad. Now, when we we see the hippos what's going on is that, are those more hippos sorry i'm hearing splashing but i didn't know if it was crocodiles that are you know, swimming out into the water if it was more hippos they're like i don't know what they're doing it's so dark out here i can't see anything so it wasn't those ones it was the ones ahead where's my spotlight i just want to do a quick shine quickly just to see what's actually going on there no it's just more hippos sorry i thought that there was maybe some crocodiles that have been disturbed off the bank and they decided that they're going to go for a little swim that's not the case though it was just some hippos playing around but hopefully they come and play around a little bit closer to where we are so we can get a better view but off you go to ralph to see what other cool things he's managed to find in the tent well everyone i want to show you a couple of small little things under the microscope because there's all sorts of creepy crawlies that move around here in the bush and well we like to get up close and personal and see it exactly what it looks like so let's go there now what i found on the road and unfortunately this little guy got driven over by one of the vehicles but it does happen this at some times i'm sure everywhere where you are you may be also seeing them get stuck in the front of the car when you're driving along this is a little butterfly and we're looking very closely at him you see there those tentacles in the front that i'm showing you with my little porcupine quill that's what he uses to feel his way around and as i move him a little bit you can see his wonderful wings I'll just try and flatten it a bit for you there that you can see the lovely colors of brown and it goes into orange and then it also does go into a whitey color over there. And something to always remember with butterflies is that you should never grab them by the wings if you can help it, especially on the inside because they have this very fine powder that helps uh, to keep their wings good enough to help them fly. Now this particular butterfly is an African monarch and the little caterpillar that this one comes from, he likes to feed on plants that are poisonous. So when the butterfly comes from the caterpillar, it is also poisonous. So the animals don't like eating it because he really tastes not very nice at all. So that is our little African monarch butterfly. Now, hard it, I'm trying to see the yellow part on the front. That is just some of the colored dust that is on the wings itself over there. And you see, as I touch it, it also starts coming off. And you see, and then if this was a live butterfly, I would really be damaging it by doing this to it. So you must never grab the butterfly by the inside of the wings. Well, you should try not to grab a butterfly at all. You should just rather leave them to get on with their business and they help us because they pollinate the flowers. So if we have lots of butterflies, we will have lots more flowers as well. Now, that's our little butterfly and I do want to just show you 
um, something else as well, which is very exciting because we've got something else here that I do want to show you just quickly. Um, and uh, let's go back to our microscope over here. There we are. Now, this is one of our dung beetles that walks around and he collects the dung balls and the poo from all the animals and he rolls them into a ball and then they lay their egg inside of it. And then the little worms uh, hatch from the eggs and they then eat on the poo and then they turn into beetles. So these are called dung beetles. I'm just going to turn it upside down so you can see a little bit of his legs there. And I just have to get it nicely in the middle. It looks quite strange here underneath the microscope, hey? There's his legs. So it's all very interesting, isn't it? And when they are alive, they are very strong with those legs because they need to be, because they make very big dung balls. And it's almost like as if you were trying to push a bus. And if you had to try and push a bus, you would have to be really strong all on your own. And this little beetle, uh, he can push uh, the same size as a bus uh, in compared to the big poo ball that he makes. But it's very interesting, isn't it? And he helps to put the poo back into the soil. And then all the plants can grow out of the poo and all sorts. So very important are the dung beetles, aren't they? As well as the butterflies. It's all very, very interesting. Now, Zach, yes, you are absolutely right. They eat poo because there's lots of nutrients in it. And these are vegetarian uh, beetles as well. So they'll eat the poo, which is normally coming from an elephant or an impala or any of the antelope. And they'll, they'll take that poo and um, roll it into a ball, eat some of it, and also lay their eggs in it. And they normally bury it underneath the ground. So that is very, very, very interesting. And that's one of the reasons we need to respect all the little things out there, even down to a little mosquito. Now, I know that David is still with our wonderful leopards. Let's go and see if he's managed to get up. Tingana is not performing very well this evening in terms of just showing us his strong neck muscles or his hind quarters and his big paws and his huge head because even up to this minute he is sleepy 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 I almost even myself fell asleep but I remember I have to be careful because if Tingana would walk very close to me and I open my eyes and see him very near to me he'll give me a very big surprise so i decided not to nap and wait and we are still waiting in the meantime kit i would want to teach you some animals here in africa that we call the big five and big five animals not by virtue of how big they are is some we call them the big five because of how dangerous they have been to man and Leopard is one of them. So we can proudly say today we have seen one of the big and look all right kids There you go. There you are. Tingana is up The leopard is up. Let's find out where he's going. See if he's going to the kill That will be just wonderful. So we're gonna reposition or he sat down, but either way I think a better position than he was so let me just turn around and see if I go the other side and you'll be able to see him much better but let's find out what taylor has for the moment look 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 i've got a baby hippopotamus remember how we were just talking about how that they might uh, they might struggle in the deep water when they're new now this is a teeny tiny little hippo this is very new oh it's so sweet look at that trying to hang around near near mum not going too far away that's so amazing oh shame but it's having to bob up and down i think the water over there is even too deep for it but eventually it will get big and strong enough now frisco yes hippos will sleep in the water 
they have their naps during the day, that's their favorite time to sleep in the water, is because hippos actually spend more of their time at night moving around than they do during the day. So during the day is when they rest. So soon, this big mama hippo is going to have to climb out of the water so that she can go and eat. And that little hippo is going to follow her. I don't think she'll be going too far away. Not while it is so young. I think that's very young. Maybe only a few days old to a week old. It's very excited that look at it, it's adventuring around. It's so cool. Oh, I think it wishes mom was in more shallow water. Now, Demanzo, you've asked if a baby hippo has a special name. They're called calves. Hippo calves. So like you would call a baby calf. <laughs> Look, it's trying to jump up onto mom's back. Mom's too big. And you can see how shallow the water is there because she's sitting down on her on her legs at the moment. So it's very shallow. But it just goes to show you how small that baby is. Shame, it's so cute. It's so excited. And now I've completely forgotten the question. What was the question again, Kirsten? There was, I was going to tell you something and then I got distracted by its cuteness. Oh, the baby hippo's name. But you know what I like to call them? When they are this old, I like to call them a potamus. And when they get to as big as mom, then they turn into a hippopotamus. But that's just what we like to call them because they're so cute. They haven't quite turned into a big, big dangerous hippopotamus just yet. Oh, Shane, why did you come out so we can see you? Mom is very relaxed with us around here, too. <laughs> Devani, now you've asked, how do those hippos hear with such tiny ears? Well, I suppose when they're underneath the water, they don't need to hear very well. And they do spend quite a bit of their day underwater. And it's quite cool the way that their ears, their eyes, and their head, not their head, their ears, their eyes, and their nose sticks out of the water all at the same time. So they can have all their senses out, so their, their sight, their hearing, their sense of smell, and then the whole rest of their body is hidden away. So they almost become invisible. Oh, did you see, Mom? Did you see what she did? She almost looked like she moved into maybe some deeper water so that that little one could climb onto its back. So they can hear perfectly fine. That's not a problem. That was very nice of Mom because now that little one might be able to rest its head on Mom's back. It's probably getting quite tired now, going up and down. Come on, Mom. Everybody else is out of the water. Let's go out of the water. Let's see, where are you going to go? You're going to go to the shallow bank? Oh, it is too. Look there, it can stand. You see that? Now, when a little hippopotamus is born, it can I suppose it can weigh anywhere between about... 40 pounds and maybe a hundred pounds somewhere around there so they're so tiny in comparison to mom mom's quite mom can get quite big she can weigh well over a ton so she's a monster in comparison but there we go you see mom's walking now that little baby can stand there so it's probably quite happy look how tiny it is in comparison it's got a long way to go before it reaches that big size <gasps> just coming up to mom for a little for little nudges. Now, that little one is going to have to hold its breath when it wants to drink mom's milk. It has to go underwater. But they learn that very quickly and how to do that. And I suppose that's all practice because eventually a hippo is able to hold its breath and not come up for air for six minutes. Can you imagine staying in the swimming pool without coming up for air for six minutes? That'd be amazing. Imagine all the people you could trick. You could swim underwater. You could pull people's toes and they won't even know that you're under there. That's what I would do if I could hold my breath for six minutes. I really wish this little one would come out onto the land, but I don't think it will come out without mom. I think it knows. There we go. Mom's following it now. Now, Ali, it's probably, you, well, you've asked, why is it wiggling its ears? Maybe there's some insects around. Maybe the water. Maybe it's trying to get it out. You know when you get water in your ears, how you jump around on one leg to try and shake it out? Maybe that's why it's doing it. But there are also lots and lots of insects around. There's little mosquitoes. There's all sorts of things. So that could be irritating its little ears too. But I think it might be the water. Just shaking off all of that excess water. See, mom doesn't like it going to the edge. You see how she gets nervous and she says, come on, little one, come follow me back to the, the deeper water where it's safer. She doesn't seem to be ready to get out just yet. Oh, precious. They got hairy bottoms though and hairy tails. Now, 
Kelly, this is a great question. You've asked, do their eyes glow in the dark? They are, but that's just the reflection. So remember how we said we were using the special light called infrared light or IR light? The animals can't see this, this wave of light. So it is still a light and we can't see it either. That's why I just see pitch pitch black out here but that is that infrared light reflecting off of their eyes so that's what's creating that i'm sure you've seen it with your cats and dogs before how sometimes it doesn't need to be much light around but your cat's eyes can still glow that's exactly because of that Whee! up and down bouncing about oh what a sweet little baby hippo a little potamus come on mom you're almost out there. We want to see how large you really are. Oh, who's she chasing? Oh, she just chased another hippo. That Maybe that's her other calf. I wonder if that's her older calf. And she's now got this brand new baby, but that calf doesn't know what to do because it's been living with mom for the last two years or so. See, it's very, very tough. That little one just wants to hang around with mom. And, and eventually, maybe this, actually, maybe this little baby hippo is even newer than we thought. Maybe it's only a few hours old to a day old. Because she doesn't seem to want to have her older calf around at all. She said, no, no, you wait over there. And she might be like that for a few days. But eventually, that older one will be allowed back quite close. And then this one and the adult will grow up to be the best of friends. <laughs> And this is a great question. The last question for the Sunset Safari is from Reva. And you've asked, what are hippos made of? I think that hippos are made of sugar and spice and all things nice. Hey, don't you think? Oh, I think that's so cool. Well, it's been an amazing safari. And I'm so happy that I've had Shauna May uh, join us Horizon Elementary as well as Hampton Oaks Elementary. We've had some great questions from, from all of you. And I hope that you've enjoyed the safari just as much as, as we have. I think you've all been very spoiled and you've seen lots and lots of animals. Now, remember to brush your teeth, do your homework and listen to what your teachers say. And don't be too naughty at home. Otherwise, you'll have to deal with me. But thank you. And for everybody else, we'll see you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari.